The development you predicted in the Kastner case happened unexpectedly. Please come back immediately. How can it be unexpected if I have predicted it? Poirot, my friend, is that you? Over here, Poirot. Poirot, is it truly you, my friend? Book, it is indeed me. What brings you so far from home? A little affair in Syria. An affair of the heart? No, no, a modest affair of recovering stolen artifacts. But now I am summoned home to England and must leave immediately. This evening? You travel on the Orient Express, I hope. I have made no arrangements yet, as I just learned that an emergency has arisen, and I must return to England immediately. Very well. It will be my pleasure to secure you a sleeper on the Orient Express. If the director of the line insists, I accept with pleasure. And we'll dine together, for I too depart this afternoon. We'll have plenty of time to catch up. I'll have the hotel transfer our luggage. Excuse me, sir. You are the director of the line? The Princess Dragomirov would like to know if she may keep her minor in her compartment on the train. Uh, good morning, Princess. It is an honor to welcome you aboard. There is absolutely no problem for your pet. You will ask about his food? Oh, yes. The Princess Dragomirov would like to know if there is food for minors on board. Insects? Uh, small amphibians? Baby rodents? Baby... Rodents? Of course, Princess. Don't worry. Your bird will be fed as you demand. You there. Desk clerk. One moment, sir. Listen to me. Call the police. My train ticket has been stolen. Stolen? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You travel by the Orient Express, monsieur? Arbuthnot. Captain Archibald Arbuthnot. Formerly British Army, now retired. And yes, I'm taking the Orient Express to Paris. But what business is that of yours? My name is Book. I am the director on the line at your service. And perhaps this gentleman could assist you. He is Hercule Poirot. I... oh. Uh, but I must make that train. <laughs> A train ticket. Yesterday I recovered artifacts worth several millions. Please, my friend. It's not just any ticket. It's an Orient Express ticket. Very well, I will investigate. Thank you, Poirot. I will arrange a car to Sirkechi station for us. How do you know your ticket has been stolen, monsieur? I put it on a table in my room. I came down here to breakfast, and when I got back, my ticket was gone, and other things were on the floor, as if they'd been tossed about. Hello, monsieur. I suggest we begin in your room. Will you lead the way? I'm right again. 
That happens to me a lot. Floor, Captain Arbuthnot? Fourth floor. Oh, one mystery solved. I suppose I can exercise my powers of observation while we wait. My little grey cells did not let me down. My room's along here, 411. In a hotel of this quality? A thief? Come on, come on, don't dawdle. It'll be a disaster if I miss that train. You have locked the door, monsieur? Naturally. This is a foreign country. You have the key card? Of course. We will enter. The lock has not been tampered with. with traces of soap. The water is scented. A perfume bottle, empty, suggestive. A perfume bottle. This earring, it is not the first time I've seen it, but where? Bed is skillfully made. A brochure for this fascinating city. Moustache. 
the conspicuous gallantry cross for meritorious service in Iraq, yet he only retired as a captain. A stamped reservation for the Bosphorus Ferry. Four floors. It's impossible for a thief to have exited through the window. The wallet is somewhat warm. It contains just over $200 and the usual cards. Hmm, a fact sheet from a tour of Saint Sophia. A list of travel expenses, but how did these papers end up on the floor? That was easy. Go away, please. A brief word, sir. I will give you two brief words. Go away. Monsieur. I've been traveling all night from New York. Must I call the management? Pardon, monsieur. I do not believe we have awakened a thief. The room is apparently empty. I will leave it for the moment. Why was there an earring in your room? An earring? A previous guest, I suspect. I don't wear them. Did you leave the window open? No. That must be how the thief escaped. I think not. Unless the thief had wings. The bed is very neatly made, but the corners are not military style. The price we paid for this hotel? I'm not going to make my own bloody bed. Interesting pronoun, that. We. How long were you at breakfast, Captain? A half an hour or so. Just a roll and some coffee. The wind probably blew the papers on the floor as it came in through the window. Moreover, the door is closed, and I found an earring on the bedside table. 
the captain invited a woman into his room. Maybe she is our culprit. Et voilà. I choose to go this way. That's the right answer. Captain Arbuthnot, I have examined your room. Much was revealed, possibly more than you expected. Rest assured, we will soon find your ticket. It's about bloody time. I have a train to catch. As do I. You are traveling on the Orient Express? We. Oui. If you will be good enough to answer a few questions, we may both make our train. Ask away. Please, give me an account of your movements yesterday. I spent most of my day in Istanbul, sightseeing. I returned to the hotel as the sun was setting. The desk clerk can confirm I was alone when I picked up my key. I spent the night alone. I had no visitors in my room. Have you told me the entire truth, Captain Arbuthnot? Of course. I want you to find my ticket. Can you explain the earring I found on the bedside table? An earring? Ah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, forgive me, Mr. Poirot. I had some business correspondence that wanted answering. The hotel provides help for business travelers. They sent up a secretary. I dictated a letter and she mailed it for me. I hadn't noticed that she had lost an earring. And when did you invite this uh, secretary? This woman may be the thief we are looking for. That was yesterday evening. My ticket was still there when I went down to breakfast. She can't have taken it. Hmm, I see. Never mind. It is easily checked. And uh, there was no other person in your room? No, I swear there wasn't. Ah, well, never mind. If it is not her, there is only one option left. Fine. Please finish your job quickly. I'll be downstairs in the lobby. The Hotel Turcatlian is a perfect prelude for my journey. Pardon, Monsieur. May I inquire when the staff begins cleaning the rooms? Every morning at breakfast time, sir. After making certain there are no guests in the room, of course. May I speak with the chambermaid who cleaned room 411 this morning? I hope you don't think that one of our staff stole the ticket. No, 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 no. Do not distress yourself. We seek only information. I will summon her at once. Oh, I'd ask her to bring her laundry cart.
Do not be frightened, mademoiselle. Did you clean room 411 this morning? Room 411? Yes, that is one of mine. Did you see a ticket on the desk when you entered the room? I I'm sorry, I, I didn't notice a ticket. There was a wallet, but of course I did not touch it. Did you open the window? Yes, we always air the rooms. Oh, but I forgot to close the window. While I was making the bed, the person from next door was pounding on the wall. I wondered if he needed assistance. I tossed the dirty sheets in my cart, quickly finished mopping and went to see, but it was nothing. But I'm afraid I left the window open. I'm so sorry. The window left open, papers scattered on the floor. The chambermaid cleaning the room. I believe I can now visualize what happened. Poirot is not going to touch the dirty laundry. My little grey cells did not let me down. Mademoiselle, would you be so kind as to look in the sheets from room 411? And so the missing train ticket completes its strange journey. An open window, a laundry cart, and an annoying neighbor. But chance is the only guilty party in this dark mystery. Mr. Poirot, I apologize. I believe my concern got the better of me, and I forgot myself. Thank you. It was a case of great magnitude. I'm glad I was up to the challenge. And that, I think, is that. Our bags are all packed. I have my ticket and papers. If you give me yours, I'll hang on to mine. But as your secretary, as my secretary, you see to the bags, Hector. Yes. Yes, sir. That man, I have a curious impression of him. As if I were observing a wild animal, uncaged. We must leave for the station. Our bags are in the taxi. Did you find the ticket? It was a case most difficult, but somehow Hercule Poirot managed. I knew you could do it. Now we can sit back and enjoy a relaxing train ride. You are in luck, Poirot. Of course, no journey on this train is ever ordinary, but this is a special occasion. To celebrate the 140 years of the Orient Express, the engine will be none other than the splendid Pacific 231G558. There she is, Poirot. The most celebrated train in history. Oh, my eyes fill with tears of pride. It is time we were aboard, my friend. Follow me. 
The wagon lead conductor, Pierre Michel, will direct you to your compartment. Lead the way, book. It was built in France in 1922 by the Compagnie Batignol Châtillon. At the time of its purchase by the SNCF in 1938, it could reach speeds up to 130 kilometers per hour. <laughs> Wait until you see. It is like traveling back in time. Today, the train is limited to 100 kilometers per hour. I assure you, that will be more than fast enough to get you to Paris in time for your connection to London. In the meantime, you will bask in the magic that is the Orient Express. Good evening, monsieur. Your compartment is number 202. However, I am afraid that all the others are already full. Full? But how can that be? It is incredible, monsieur. All the world elects to travel tonight. All the same, you must find room for this gentleman here. I can exercise my powers of observation while they try to find me a bed. He is a friend of mine. He can have number 201. It is taken, monsieur. What? Number 201? Yes, monsieur. We are full. Full everywhere. The 100. Is everything aboard the train, Hector? In your compartment, Mr. Ratchet. I'm having them disinfect the room again, as you instructed. I also got a call from the Indians. The sale is going through as you expected. There was never any doubt. No other phone calls, Hector, from Geneva or Venice? No, sir. Who were you expecting? Never you mind. Check our tickets. We're not going in until everything is confirmed. The young man seems quite agreeable, but the other... The older man is something quite different. Notice the young woman from the hotel. She again wishes to watch the old man with his little friend, but not to be seen herself. Darling, we have to get aboard. I know, I know. I have heard of the phobia fear of flying. Hero of trains? Now you're making fun of me. Never, my lord. We'll board shortly, once our compartment is ready. Why did you order so much lobster, Hotaru? My dear Freya, I need it for my speciality on the second night. And if the lobster a la mori isn't fresh, the passengers will know. We don't have enough space for my desserts. Tonight, molten chocolate cake. Tomorrow, my specialty. That is not my concern. They will not have room for them anyway. Serve your lobster tonight. Chicken a la mori must be the first night dish for the travelers. It is easier to digest. Ugh, you really are the egomaniac everyone says you are. I have every reason to be. I am the engine. You are just the kaboom. Mary. Not now. Not now. When it's all over, when it's behind us, then. Well, I am mortified. The 140th anniversary, perhaps, but such a plague of passengers. the right answer. Wow! 
we have a solution. A gentleman has not yet come. An Englishman, a Monsieur Harris. A name of good omen. It is already time to leave. What do I care for, Mr. Harris? As Monsieur pleases. I had your things sent straight to your compartment. Unfortunately, you will be with another traveler. No. Only for the first night. It cannot be helped. I will survive, mon ami. Monsieur Book, we can't find enough space in the kitchen refrigerator to store all of my ingredients. How is it possible? His recipes are extravagant. We need to leave something on the platform. If my lobsters don't go, I don't go. And have the passengers of the Orient Express go hungry? Never. Must I intervene? The problem is unworthy of the problem. But I do not intend to starve on the most luxurious train in the world. Thank you for coming to help us. It is impossible to fit everything into the Gary's refrigerator. Obviously, my entree are more important than dessert. If Mr. Mori delays his lobsters for a day or two, we can restock at another station. Delay? You ask me to delay? Prea? Calm yourself, my friend. I'm sure we can find a solution. Is that a diagram of the refrigerator? May I see it? Yes. He refuses to look at it. Voilà. Mr. Paul, I will reserve the finest lobster just for you. I look forward to it, monsieur. And to the dessert, mademoiselle. Hopefully. That will be the last mystery you face on our journey, my dear Poirot. Your compartment for tonight only is at the back of the second-class carriage, number 102. Tomorrow, you move to a private compartment. Welcome, Monsieur Parron. I apologize for the delay. Thank you, Monsieur Michel. I am delighted you could accommodate me. These first-class rooms are very spacious and luxurious. Pardon me? Oh, my apologies. This lady has a style of her own, eccentric but chic. Excuse me, I think you made a mistake. You are Mr. Harris? No, my name is McQueen. I... There is no other berth on the train, monsieur. All is arranged. Yours is the upper berth. We start in one minute. The train's remarkably full. En voiture! Listen, sir, if you'd rather have the lower berth, easier and all that, well, that's all right by me. No, 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 you are too amiable. It is for one night only, at Belgrade. 
Oh, I see. You're getting out of Belgrade. Not exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. You may join the rest of the passengers in the dining car. Excuse me, Monsieur. Pierre asked me to inform you that a passenger left us, so his room is yours. Monsieur Bouc instructed that your things be transferred to room 202 during dinner. You will be more comfortable in first class. It is true what you say. Thank you, uh... Mr. Fouché, Monsieur. What is your position on the Orient Express? I manage the bar car, and I also do the restaurant car service. Well, then do not let me keep you. Lobster tonight, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Where will my new compartment be? Room 202 is at the far end of the previous car. I see. Thank you. I'll leave you to it, then. See you soon, monsieur. Please, my friend, join me. I have taken the liberty of ordering you your lobster. Thank you. It appears our fellow passengers are all gathered here again tonight. Ah. If I had but the pen of a Balzac, I would depict the scene. Oh, it is an idea, that. Ah, you agree. It has not been done, I think, and yet... It lends itself to romance, my friend. All around us are people of all classes, of all nationalities, of all ages. For three days, these people, these strangers to one another, are brought together. They sleep and eat under one roof. They cannot get away from each other. At the end of the journey, they part. They go their several ways, never perhaps to see each other again. Certainly it interests us, inviting us to watch and wonder about their lives. Ah, I know you, my friend. Even now, 
Your mind, it is at work. Let us test it. For example, what do you make of those two? Mamma mia, you can feel the power of an engine. We climb into the mountains with ease. I know something about the power, and this baby has it in spades. There's something special about a train. I'll give you that. I sell toys, and model trains are one of our biggest items. And not just for children, either. You sell model cars, too? Sure, but give me a train any day. Oh, my friend. What do you have against the cars? Now I work at Fortuna in Italy as a spokesperson. We are producing the next generation of electric cars, the Fortuna Firenze. Like the city, it is beautiful. We got the competitors looking over their shoulders so much, they're going to hit something. Didn't mean to be insulting. It's just that there's something magical about a train. My little gray cells did not let me down. The loud gentleman is very confident, a master of his own fate. It is as much in the inflection as it is in the words. He believes in winning, also that he is the one who will win. You are a magician. Oh, it is not a parlor trick, my friend. It is simply observation. I was visiting my daughter. She works at the American Embassy in Istanbul. I told her she'd never find a husband there. Since I wanted to see Paris on my way home, she told me I should take this high-class train. I can't wait to see Paris. It looks beautiful in the movies, but it couldn't be more beautiful than Schenectady in the good old US of A. <laughs> That's where I'm living now. And you, uh, Miss Debenham, was it? Where do you hail from? I was born in the UK. Oh, that's in England, isn't it? What do you do for a living? I teach English to children in other countries. I see. Oh, I wish I spoke a foreign language. My daughter speaks several languages. Let me tell you about her work. It's very important. This is wrong, but I'm... That was easy. There is much you can learn about someone just by observing them and listening. For example, that lady is reserved. She reveals little. She is self-contained. Some secret prompts her to allow her dinner companion to carry the conversation. I confess, in this case, what I witnessed in Istanbul suggests more. But I will respect her privacy. You will always amaze me. My friend, this is one of the best desserts I have ever eaten. You have always had the sweet tooth. But this... this... It is a masterpiece. I can't understand how the dessert can be so good. I would love to know what the recipe is. I couldn't tell what flavor the ice cream is. It looks like lemon. Look at the zest. Y yes, I wasn't sure what that was. W what is the red fruit? It looks like a raspberry. Mm. You have a good eye, Poirot. The biscuit is the foundation of the dessert. All else is built upon it. 
What do you think? It looks like crushed biscuits, my friend. Finally observed, indeed. Poirot, I am embarrassed to ask you a great favor. My friend, I am on this train due to the great favor you have done me. How may I assist you? This dessert is sublime. If only I had the recipe. Unfortunately, the pastry chef, Miss Nielsen, she will guard her secrets. But you, my friend, I am sure you could make her confess. You wish me to persuade the pastry chef to give up her recipe? You who are the expert at interrogation. Book, it is a dessert. It is the pinnacle of desserts. You, my friend, who, as you say, are on this train, I blush to remind you. Fine, you win. Again, what wouldn't I do for you, my friend? Oh, thank you, Poirot. Good luck. Good evening, mademoiselle. Good evening, sir. How can I help you? That was a magnificent dessert you served us tonight. I wanted to tell you personally how much both Monsieur Bouc and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, sir. In fact, it is so good. Monsieur Bouc insists on knowing how you made it. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. You must know a chef never gives away their recipes. But... Well, you helped with the refrigerator, and without space in it for me, there would have been no dessert. Very well. To prepare tonight's dessert, first I melt sugar to make caramel. Then I spread this caramel to make tuile. Between two tuiles, I add a small scoop of lemon ice cream, and I put the whole thing on a strawberry crown. Poirot, you are suspicious even now. The pastry chef gave up her prized recipe a little too easily. I sense she wasn't entirely honest with me. Thank you for sharing your recipe with me. But I doubt those are strawberries you're using. Oops. You have a good eye, Monsieur Poirot. Very well. What fruit do you think I used? You used raspberries, not strawberries. I'm not fooled. You're right. Mr. Book, he couldn't tell the difference. Let's move on to the bottom part of the dessert. My favorite part of the dessert. First, I melted some butter. I crumbled pieces of chocolate into the butter. Then I placed the mix in a circular mold. Finally, I let the whole thing cool down to let it harden. It's certainly not chocolate that you've crumbled. I see you do have an excellent palate. Do you know what ingredients I used? A clever pastry chef might mix crushed biscuits with butter to create this delicious base. That's it. You're getting closer to the entire recipe. Closer? <laughs> I've caught murderers with less difficulty than this. I'll give you one last challenge. I'm sure you will be able to figure out the order I mix my ingredients in. If you can, you will have earned my recipe. Mademoiselle, solving the murder of Roger Ackroyd was easier than this. I must admit I'm not right this time. That's the right answer.
as promised, my recipe is yours. Give me five minutes to write it down for you. Thank you. I am in your debt. I can take advantage of this moment to resume my little observations of the... I made a lot of progress on the expenses last night, sir. I should be done by tomorrow morning. You're supposed to be a fast worker, Hector. Sorry, sir. Working here is not as comfortable as in our office in Boston. You're lucky to ride in a train like this. My little gray cells did not let me down. Did you enjoy the meal? I'm not used to meals like this. You do not have good restaurants in Kenya? Actually, we do. This is in the 1930s. I did not mean to offend. You didn't like the meal? The lobster, it was undercooked, and the potatoes were too dry. I expect, being Princess Dragomirov's assistant, you must be used to eating well. Cooking is an art. You do not need to wear the chef's hat to be an artist. What is your favorite dish? Curry roast. It is a specialty of mine. That's the right answer. Here you are, sir. My recipe. Please tell Mr. Book he should not expect my recipes for the other desserts. Thank you very much, mademoiselle. I know he will sincerely appreciate the gesture, and I will make certain he gets the message. Poirot, you were gone such a long time. It proved more challenging than I expected. This is wonderful. Did it require the use of your little gray cells? More the exercise of my little taste buds. Thank you so much, my friend. Eat your dessert. You've earned it. Good evening. My name is Ratchet. I think that I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Hercule Poirot, is that so? You have been correctly informed, Monsieur. Your exploits are well known on my side of the Atlantic. In my country, we come to the point quickly. Mr. Poirot, I want you to take on a job for me. Are you interested in earning a lot of money? My clientele, Monsieur, is limited nowadays. I undertake very few cases. Why, naturally. I understand that. But this, Mr. Poirot, means big money. Big money. That was easy. What is it you wish me to do for you, Monsieur uh, Ratchet? Mr. Poirot, I am a rich man. A very rich man. Men in that position have enemies. I have an enemy. Monsieur, in my experience, when a man is in a position to have, as you say, enemies, then it does not usually resolve itself into one enemy only. Yes, I appreciate that point. Enemy or enemies, it doesn't matter. What does matter is my safety. My life has been threatened, Mr. Poirot. Now, I'm a man who can take pretty good care of himself. But as I look at it, a little insurance wouldn't hurt. And remember, big money. I regret, monsieur, that I cannot oblige you. What's wrong with my proposition? If you will forgive me for being personal, I do not like your face, Mr. Ratchet. Oh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to finish my coffee peacefully.
another golden moustache to treasure. A nightcap, Monsieur Poirot? A cup of coffee, Monsieur Fauché. Then I will retire to my new compartment. I am sure you will find it to be most comfortable. We have stopped? Yes, sir. Belgrad Station. If you'd like to go out and get some fresh air, now is the time. The train leaves at 9.15. No, no, I see that it is snowing. I will not seek out the fresh air. Probably a wise decision. May I suggest a chocolate to accompany your coffee? It is produced by my father, the best chocolatier in Switzerland. I would never refuse a chocolate with such high recommendation. I know you will enjoy it, and please let me know if there is anything else you require. My little grey cells did not let me down. Everything was perfect. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Is there anything you require, monsieur? No, merci. thought you'd left us. You said you were getting off at Belgrade. You misunderstood me. But, man, your baggage, it's gone. It has been moved into another compartment, that is all. Oh, I see. I wish you a good night, Monsieur Poirot. Good night. I hope you'll sleep well and that your head will be better in the morning. It is just the cold. I'm now making my... Monsieur Ratchet seems very upset. for a king, or a very tired detective. Monsieur Ratchet? Ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé.
गुड नाइट मैडम The American lady? Yes, don't worry. You'll know how Mrs. Hubbard is. Imagine to yourself the time I have had with her. She insists, but insists that there is a man in her compartment. Just imagine it, monsieur. In a space of this size, where would he conceal himself? I argue with her. I point out that it is impossible. She insists. She woke up and there was a man there. And how, I ask, did he get out? and leave the door bolted behind him but she will not listen to reason hmm that one does not leave time to listen the train has stopped mr michel we have run into a snowdrift heaven knows how long we shall be here i remember once being snowed in for 7 days where are we between vinkovsky and brod oh la la it's time for me to go back to bed i wish you a good night monsieur or what is left of it train is still stuck and the snow continues to fall i should have taken an airplane well i must make the best of it and join the other passengers for breakfast Good morning, Monsieur Michel. Good morning, sir. Please enjoy our special breakfast in our restaurant. This delay is intolerable. I am supposed to be demonstrating. My daughter said it would be the easiest way in the world. Just sit on the train until I got to Paris. Good morning, madam. The snow is a predicament, is it not? I am Russian. Snow is no stranger to me. Ah, the accent. Would it be Saint Petersburg? You are very perceptive. Monsieur Poirot, is it not? And may I take it I have the honor of addressing Princess Natalia Dragomirov. We dispense with the old titles these days. My husband, all of my past. was taken from me by these stalinists when they were gone i became director of the st petersburg museum of antiquities to restore and preserve what i can of my country's history still the delay must be vexing if i must be late for my appointments then they will wait i know that i would certainly wait madam it has been my extreme pleasure to make your acquaintance madam au revoir monsieur poirot A beautiful piano. What a luxury. Pity there's no one to play it. Mademoiselle, you are not concerned about the train stopping? What can one do? Indeed, this does not make the train move. You have great strength to remain calm at a time like this. I know one far far stronger than I. And that is? Well, that old lady, for instance. You have probably noticed her. She just has to lift her little finger and ask for something in a polite voice, and the whole train runs. It runs also for my friend Monsieur Bouc, but that is because he is a director of the line, not because he has a masterful character. You don't have to have a strong will when you have power, but I suspect I did not need to tell you that, Mr. Poirot. Mr. Poirot. 
Good morning, Mr. Fauché. You have early customers, I see. Yes. I am stuck serving here as well at breakfast. Everyone is impatient. They keep complaining that the train is not moving. As if I could get out and push it. It's too early for me to order a boxcar. That is the appropriate drink, I believe. A gin, triple sec, lemon and grenadine mix. A drink for a train indeed. But not perhaps for my breakfast. I think I will settle for an omelette. Good luck, sir. Miss Nielsen is helping to serve in the dining car. How long are we expected to be stranded here? It won't do much good complaining to me. That fellow there with the moustache, he may know something. Excusez-moi, sir. Yes? Monsieur Bouc asks for you to join him in compartment 203. Uh, look here, Poirot. Can you tell us anything? I can tell you the snow, it will not move aside on its own. Of course. But you obviously have some influence with Book. I am going to see him now. I will ask him if he has any information. We have need of you. What has occurred? A passenger lies dead in his bed. Stabbed. A passenger? Which passenger? In there. He's an American. A man called Ratchet. It was his valet masterman who was worried that Mr. Ratchet was not awake yet. Pierre Michel, the conductor, decided to break in and found the body. I see. Well, my friend, I think it is best not to touch anything and wait for the police to arrive. Oh, I tried to call the police, but there is no cell tower for many kilometers. We could be stuck in the snow for hours. The murderer is with us. On the train, now! The sooner we catch him, the sooner we'll be out of danger. The Dr. Constantine is already examining the body. Mon ami, this is not a missing train ticket. We must follow procedure. We must wait for the police to secure the crime scene. Please, Poirot. I will take full responsibility. Book, you ask. Well, if we cannot contact the outside world, then... Oh, you are going to drive me crazy. In truth, this problem intrigues me. I was reflecting not half an hour ago that many hours of boredom lay ahead whilst we are stuck here. And now, a problem lies ready to my hand. You accept, then? C'est entendu. You place the matter in my hands. Mr. Poirot, I am Dr. Constantine. Forgive me, Doctor, you are a medical examiner? No, but I have assisted in post-mortems at Nairobi Hospital, where I am a teaching fellow. I am familiar with your excellent institution. I do not intend to perform a full autopsy, but a preliminary examination should be of some use. Of course. May I have a look? Then we can compare notes. Please. If you need any help, I won't be far away. gone. The chain lock is broken. Monsieur Michel told me that he broke the chain on the door to get into the room. I wonder what could be in this photo. A box of sleeping pills. I'll take photos.
expensive clothing recently laundered. Postcard, someone with the initials A W. Ratchet had an appointment he will never keep. I'll take photos. Not very surprising. This door communicates with compartment 204. The latch is open on this side. I'm sure I will find some interesting things inside. This phone was deliberately smashed. Last night, Monsieur Ratchet said he takes precautions. I see now what he meant. He knew he was in danger and wanted to be ready. Yet it was no use to him. I will leave it here for the police. it belong to a ratchet? A handkerchief. There's a letter H embroidered on it. As you see, the victim has been stabbed many times. Several alone would have been fatal. Yes, I agree. An attack most savage. I will, of course, prepare a complete report on my findings. Thank you. The watch is broken. The hands are stopped at 1.15 a.m. One would expect that to be the time when the attack occurred. I'm sorry, Doctor, but I must question you. Of course. I must be considered under suspicion like everyone else. May I know your movements last night? I share compartment 101 with Mr. Booth. He would not stop talking about his beloved train. I listened to him for hours talking about his Orient Express. My friend Book will no doubt confirm this. Did you know the victim? Not at all. I noticed him last night at dinner, but I did not pay much attention. Did you touch anything in here this morning? I checked for a pulse. There was none. 
rigor mortis had commenced. The body was cool to the touch. I touched nothing else. What can you tell me about the victim? He died from multiple stab wounds of varying angles and depth. More than one would have been fatal. I would place the time of death roughly between midnight and 2 a.m. With more time, I hope I can be more precise. I assume the open window complicates matters. Indeed. Conditions are not perfect. Thank you for your help, Doctor. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. I shouldn't leave until I have finished inspecting the crime scene. Hmm, the snow is falling only lightly this morning. The murderer would have left tracks in the snow if he had jumped out the window. I shouldn't leave. So, the murderer must have exited through Madame Hubert's room. That's the right answer. leave until I have finished inspecting the crime scene. I shouldn't leave until I have finished inspecting the crime scene. the reading material one would expect of a man like Ratchet? I 
I shouldn't leave until I have finished inspecting the crime scene. I can't imagine Ratchet taking a sleeping pill if he feared for his life. My little grey cells did not let me down. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. I think I've seen everything I need at the moment. I am counting on you to finish your analysis. I'll have a more detailed report for you as soon as I can. So, Poirot, did you find anything out? It's a bit early for the handcuffs, my friend. Even for Hercule Poirot. Do not worry, mon ami. I believe our culprit has no plans to strike again. Monsieur Ratchet was the target. Of that, I am convinced. Tell me, Book, how did you spend last night? This is a joke, I hope. Don't you trust your old friend? My friend, calm yourself. I must hear your story in order to corroborate other accounts. Ah, naturally. Let me see. Hmm. I went to my compartment after dinner. Uh, Dr. Constantine was already there. We talked about his career. He's a Cambridge man, you know. After university, he returned to his country and has done much good there. He was so interested in the Orient Express. I told him all the anecdotes I know. I'm not certain when we fell asleep, but it was very late. Here is what I have found out. Monsieur Ratchet was stabbed many times. I also found threatening letters in his safe. He had a loaded gun under his pillow, so he was on guard, ready to defend himself. However, there was an empty glass with white residue at the bottom. I suspect a barbiturate. Perhaps he was forced to take it. In any case, I am certain he was unconscious, unable to defend himself. I also found several other items at the crime scene, possibly related to the murder. They must be investigated. By all means, Poirot. As fast as you can. I also found liquid for an electronic cigarette, but I could not find a vape. This might belong to the murderer. This criminal is an amateur. I need a list of the passengers with their compartment numbers. Pierre Michel will have it. I must interview the rest of the passengers and the staff. I'll be in the bar car if you need me. We are hours late. Soon, I hope help will arrive. Monsieur Michel, I must ask you a few questions if you don't mind. I will do everything I can to help. First of all, tell me about yourself. Very well. My name, as you know, is Pierre Michel. I am from Calais. I've been with the company for over 15 years. Thank you. Voilà.
Can you provide me with a listing of the passengers and their rooms, please? Yes, certainly. Are you a smoker? Indeed. Do you smoke e-cigarettes? No. Tobacco only. I would like to reconstruct with your help the events of last night. Monsieur Ratchet retired to bed. When? Almost immediately after dinner, sir. Actually, before we left Belgrade. Did anybody go into his compartment after that? His valet, monsieur. Monsieur Masterman. And then his secretary is a young American gentleman, Monsieur McQueen. And that is the last time you saw or heard of him? No, Monsieur. You forget that Monsieur Ratchet rang his bell around 12.40 a.m. soon after we had stopped. I knocked at the door, but he called out in French, Ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé. I then left to answer another bell that had just rung. Where were you at 1.15 a.m.? I was sitting on my little seat at the end of the car, facing up the corridor. Are you sure? I left a little after 1 a.m. to speak about the snow with my colleague Jean in the bar car. I came back later. There was a call. I remember speaking to you. Indeed, I remember. Carry on. It was the American lady, Madame Hubbard. She thought she saw a man in her compartment. Then, around 1.50 a.m., I made the bed for Monsieur Ratchet's secretary, Monsieur McQueen. He had spent the evening talking with the English Captain Arbuthnot. At 2 a.m., I returned to my place and stayed there until dawn. What is the last station where we stopped? Vinkovsky. Could someone have come on board? Possibly. I was very busy. On into the weather, we were a few minutes late. We left at 12.10 a.m. Good morning, madam. I am Hercule Poirot. Caroline Hubbard. What can I do for you, Mr. Poirot? I am the bearer of unfortunate news. It's obvious with all the commotion that something has happened. Madame Hubbard, I am afraid your neighbor, Monsieur Ratchet, was murdered last night. <gasps> oh my god! I knew it! I knew it! I would like to ask you some questions, but first, may I inspect your room? Of course, yes, you must. My little gray cells did not let me down. Here is a jacket button. It bears the logo of the Orient Express. This door connects to Monsieur Ratchet's compartment. It was latched on this side. The luxury of the Orient Express is present in every detail. Come to Poirot, my exquisitely sculpted friend. Madame, please tell me about last night. The murderer was right here in my compartment. I woke up. All in the dark it was. I was just so scared I couldn't scream. I pressed the call button. I pressed and pressed. I heard footsteps running in the corridor, then a knock on my door. Come in, I screamed. And I switched on the lights at the same time. And would you believe it? There wasn't a soul there. You think he went back into the other compartment? How do I know where he went? I had my eyes shut tight. The conductor came in. I told the man what had happened, and he didn't seem to believe me. I asked him to search the room, but he found nothing. I told the conductor to look at the door between the compartments, and sure enough, it wasn't bolted. Well, 
I soon saw to that. I told him to bolt it, then and there. How is it you didn't bolt the door between the two compartments? But I had. Well, as a matter of fact, I asked that Swedish lady, um, Olsen, uh, Greta, if it was bolted, and she said it was. How was it you could not see for yourself? I was already in bed, and my toiletry bag was hanging on the hook of the door. I couldn't see the latch from where I was. What time was it when you asked her to do this for you? Oh, it must have been around 10.30 or 10.45 p.m. She'd come along to see if I had an aspirin. But instead of opening my door, she opened Mr. Ratchet's door by mistake. He said something quite rude, like, Not a chance, lady, you're too old. <laughs> it shocked her. She came in. I told her where to find the aspirin, and she got it out of my toiletry bag. <sighs> Poor girl, she didn't have a good night. The same could be said for Monsieur Ratchet. It appears Mademoiselle Olsen may be the last person to see Ratchet alive. Is this your handkerchief? No, not at all. Yet it is embroidered with an initial H, like your name. I don't care, it's not mine, and I would certainly never buy something so impractical as that frilly thing. Are you a smoker? No, definitely not. Filthy habit. I found a jacket button on your table. It looks like it belongs to... A train employee. The button bears the logo of the Orient Express. Well, of course, the conductor came in last night, but he didn't go near that table. Still, it's a safe bet that it belongs to the conductor. I'll check his jacket later, to be sure. I have not finished inspecting your room, if you don't mind. Let's see if Mrs. Rubard was telling the truth about the latch of the connecting door. This hook is probably where Mrs. Rubard hung her toiletry bag. This hook is probably where Mrs. Rubard very well from here, even with the toiletry bag attached. I'll have to clear that up with Mrs. Obaud. Mrs. Obaud, you told me that the door connecting the two compartments was closed, correct? Yes, it was, as I told you. I was already in bed and my toiletry bag was hanging on the hook of the door. I couldn't see the latch from where I was. That's why I asked Miss Olsen to check if it was closed. Are you sure everything you've told me is accurate, Madame Hubbard? Of course. I have an excellent memory. Mrs. Hubbard, I tested putting your toiletry bag on the door hook as you told me. From your bed, you can easily see the latch on the door. The toiletry bag does not hide the latch at all. Are you saying I'm lying? It may have been stuck somehow in a different position, or I may not have seen it in the darkness. Or I didn't think to look, you irritating man. Details matter, madame. A man has been most savagely murdered. You will excuse me if I attempt to separate the truth from the false. Forget my toiletry bag and focus on who entered my compartment. Probably after killing Mr. Ratchet. Madame Hubbard is a force to be reckoned with, but I suspect I'm not done with her. Thank you for your assistance, madame. I found a button from an Orient Express staff jacket. Did you lose one by any chance? No, monsieur. As you can see, I have all my buttons. 
It is not mine. While Monsieur Michel was chatting with Monsieur Fauché in the bar car between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., the murderer could have escaped Ratchet's room without being seen. My little grey cells did not let me down. to be a good lead. Very well, I choose to go this way. I believe I am addressing Monsieur Hector McQueen. Guilty as charged. I beg your pardon? Oh, sorry. Just an expression. Uh, my father used to say it. You must have had an interesting childhood. I am Hercule Poirot. No need to be modest. You're a detective. You are Monsieur Ratchet's secretary? I am Mr. Ratchet's secretary. Just over a year. I mainly take care of translating certain texts for him. Mr. Ratchet only speaks English. Prepare yourself for a shock. Your employer, Monsieur Ratchet, is dead. So they got him after all. What do you mean? You are assuming he was murdered? I know he had enemies. What can you tell me about Monsieur Ratchet? He was American. He was an antique dealer. I don't know much more. Mr. Ratchet never talked about himself or his life, but... I think Ratchet wasn't his real name, and he left the United States to run away from something, or someone. Yes? He started getting letters, threatening letters. Do you still have them? I have one. Did you know that Monsieur Ratchet had asked for my help? Asked you? No, I didn't know. He knew he was in danger. When did you last see him? Last night around 10 o'clock, I should say. Did you like your employer, Monsieur McQueen? No, I did not. He was, I'm sure, a, a cruel and dangerous man. Can you tell me your movements last night? I went back to my compartment. I read a little. In Belgrade, I went out onto the platform to smoke, but it was cold. I quickly went back in. I then went to Mr. Ratchet's compartment to take some dictation for him. I left around 10 o'clock. I saw Captain Arbuthnot, 
We ended up chatting in my compartment. Then we went out on the platform to quickly stretch our legs at Minkowski. He left around two o'clock. Thank you. I will need to check Monsieur McQueen's story with Captain Arbuthnot. I found a diary in Monsieur Ratchet's safe. Did you know about it? I kept a business appointment book, but I know he had a personal diary as well. That looks like it. Are you a smoker? Yes, I smoke cigarettes. I've tried to quit, but no luck. Can you give me this letter, please? Of course, here it is. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No, no, he hated the smell of smoke. Can you give me this letter? Of course, here it is. Monsieur Edward Masterman, I believe. May I ask you some questions? Mm, I can barely talk. I have a terrible toothache. We have a doctor on board the train. Perhaps... I do not need a doctor. I use essential oils. If you can find my flask of clove oil in my box, I would be grateful. Fine, if you insist. I will help you. By the smell, I think that the jojoba oil spilled on the other bottles, leaving their labels illegible. I must find another way to find which one is Masterman's toothache remedy. The weighing scale is soaked in jojoba oil. It's unusable. Ah, this old scale will do the job. To start, I must first arrange the vials from the lightest to the heaviest. Now that I know the order, I think that I can easily guess which one is the clove oil.
Here is Monsieur Masterman's remedy. Here is your remedy. I hope it will help. Thank you very much, sir. Ah, oh, well. I can finally speak without too much pain. I'm ready to answer your questions. You are Monsieur Ratchet's valet? Yes, sir. That is correct. Were you told that your employer was murdered? Yes, sir. A very shocking occurrence. Voilà. At what hour did you last see Monsieur Ratchet? It must have been around 9 p.m., sir. That or a little after. I went to bed around 10.30 p.m., same as the person who shares my room, Mr. Foscarelli. He almost immediately began snoring. What did you do then? I read, sir. And I spent a while soothing my toothache with clove oil and listening to the snoring. Did you hear anything during the night? Yes. My roommate's snoring. Are you a smoker? Yes, sir. I have a cigarette now and then to relax. Tell me about your employer, Monsieur Ratchet. I've been working for him for nine months. I should not wish to speak ill of the dead, but he was... Uh, not a gentleman, sir. Did you know that he had enemies? Yes, sir. I heard him discussing some threatening letters, sir, with Mr. McQueen. Did he mention these letters to you? He had been reading a letter when I came in. He asked me if I was the one who put it in his compartment. I told him that I had done no such thing, and he should report it to the police at the next station. How did he respond? He laughed, sir. <laughs> You're joking. I do not joke, sir. Forgive me, I can see you do not. Was he taking sleeping pills? Always when traveling by train, sir. He said he couldn't sleep otherwise. Last night he asked me to give him two. I did so along with a glass of water. He dissolved them in the water. Did you see him drink the water? No, sir. I left right after I gave him the pills. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No. He finds smokers disgusting. Can you tell me again why you gave sleeping pills to Monsieur Ratchet? Yes, I gave him the pills because when he takes the train, he has trouble sleeping. The letter must have worried him. He specifically asked me to prepare the sleeping pills. I didn't see him drink the water with the pills in it. Monsieur, I believe you are not telling me the truth. What? How can you say that? How could he ask you for sleeping pills when he had a meeting written in his agenda? I am very sure he had no meeting planned for the middle of last night. Masterman is right. The meeting in his agenda was not that day. He received threatening letters, one, it seems, last night. Did you know he had a gun under his pillow? And even asked for my help to watch over him? I find it strange that he asked you for sleeping pills when he was afraid for his life and prepared to defend himself. I'm sure I don't know. Maybe to calm his nerves, maybe out of habit. It makes no sense. Wait, please. Isn't it possible? that Mr. Ratchet asked me to prepare the pills, but didn't plan to drink them for some reason. It is possible. But I am a student of character, monsieur, and the Monsieur Ratchet you describe is not the man I met. If you'll excuse me, my toothache is getting worse again. I'm afraid this time you must prepare your own clove oil.
little gray cells did not let me down. This is the most likely answer. I choose to go this way. So, my friend, have you found our killer? Not yet, but I will tell you what I have learned. Please. Our assassin could have gotten on the train at Vinkovsky disguised as a conductor, entered Ratchet's room and killed him. Then he walked out through Madame Hubbard's connecting door, where he lost a button from his jacket. He had to wait for Monsieur Michel to be absent. He waited too long. The train had left the station. He was trapped aboard. Indeed. He had opened the window to make it look that he'd escaped that way. However, if he waited until the train stopped again due to snow, his footprints would have been found. The murderer is still among us, on the train. There's a problem with the second class toilets. What now? All morning passengers have been complaining that the door is locked, so I went to check. I knocked, but no one answered. I didn't think I should open it without speaking to you first. You did well, Monsieur Michel. Lead the way. I use my master key. But who is she? Is she alive? She is breathing. Then if she isn't dead, isn't she our murderer? That, my friend, is what we must find out. The ticket reads Joanna Locke, traveling in compartment 105. Miss, can you hear me? Hmm? Hmm. She's breathing. Her pulse is strong. There is no sign of physical violence. This woman is sleeping very soundly. This woman is sound asleep. Given her location, I would say she has been drugged and deposited here. Well, at least it's not another murder on my train. The train is, of course, full. Monsieur, the list I gave you indicates that Hildegard Schmidt shares her compartment. I will want to talk to her later. For now, we will concentrate on this mysterious young lady. Let's return her to her more comfortable bed. 
Good idea. Pierre, locate this woman's room and fetch the doctor. Yes, sir. I will question her when she wakes up. Please, let me know what you learn. Mademoiselle Locke's compartment is 105. I suggest we return her to her more comfortable bed. Yes, hopefully she will awaken soon. A cup of tea with white residue at the bottom. Dragon-Lee conductor's jacket, and the button is missing. and a wagon lee conductor's jacket and the button is missing. Luck so far? Poirot, I'm disappointed in you. I was certain you would have it by now. But of course you know what you're doing. It isn't booby trapped, is it? Have you tried one, two, three, four? One, two, three, four? Book. Silent like a mouse, please. I'm sorry. You're right. I'll be quiet now. You need to concentrate. I will not utter another word. Not one. Book, there will be another murder on the Orient Express in a moment. She has a gun. Come, come, Poirot. Criminals are often known to carry one. Ratchet was stabbed, not shot. But then why take it on the train? Her driver's license confirms her identity. She is American. These are fake IDs. It's certain. This badge says that Joanna Locke is an American detective with the Berkshire Police Department in Massachusetts. An American police officer? Oh. Mademoiselle Locke seems very interested in our victim. Of course. She has studied her target. Possibly. The stuffed animal is the same as in the photo found at the crime scene. What a coincidence! Mademoiselle Locke appears to have been investigating Monsieur Ratchet. Look! She's waking up! 
Thanks to you, I would not be surprised if our murder victim were also waking up. I... what? Oh, my head. What's all the yelling about? Who are you? Give me a good reason why you should not be in handcuffs. I can give you a reason, Book. Whose handcuffs will we use? I have none. Do you? Well, I... You are Joanna Locke, mademoiselle? Yeah, yes, um... Joanna Locke. I'm, um... I'm a detective. Berkshire, Massachusetts Police. I have found your credentials, mademoiselle. And I know who you are, Mr. Poirot. Then if the introductions are complete, perhaps the explanations may begin. I... I'll try. It's simple, really. I... I'm on the trail of a murderer. I had just been promoted to detective after five years on patrol. It was my first time on a major case. It had been a month since Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped. The Armstrongs were desperate for some sign of hope. I was there only for paperwork, to fill in some blanks. A topographical map. Often more important than a road map in these mountains. The phone record of the night of the kidnapping. The last call was for 911. Good evening. Colonel Armstrong? Yes. You're the detective they phoned about. Joanna Locke. I don't remember you. I'm newly assigned to the case. It's about time more detectives were involved. My wife, Sonia, she... she hasn't been herself. Every day is a waking nightmare for us. Tell me you've uncovered something new. I'm here to speak to your daughter's nanny. There was a computer problem. Her earlier statement has been lost. Oh. I see. We had hoped... Well, do as you wish. I won't be far if you need me. Mrs. Armstrong, my name is Joanna Locke. I'm a detective investigating the kidnapping of your daughter. May I talk to you? When is your baby due? Mrs. Armstrong? Sonia? I don't want to talk. I 
just want to see my daughter again. That's all that matters. The poor woman. I can't imagine how she feels. A toy castle. When I was a kid, I had a police station and a tiny squad car with a siren that really worked. Shiny facial hair. The good news is that it's gold. Hello, are you Suzanne Moreau, Daisy's nanny? Yes. I'm Joanna Locke, a detective working on Daisy's case. Is there any news? I'm afraid not. How can I help you? I'm really sorry. I'm afraid I have to take your statement again concerning the evening of Daisy's disappearance. There was a computer problem. Your statement was accidentally deleted. Of course. I want to help any way I can. Tell me about that night in your own words. The Armstrongs had a party to raise money for a museum. I think. Mrs. Armstrong is on her board. I was in charge of Daisy. I stayed with the little one all evening, playing with her and reading books to her. She couldn't sleep with all the noise and the comings and goings. When did you notice Daisy was missing? I was only gone five minutes to, to phone my mother. She's in the hospital. When I returned, Daisy wasn't in her bed. I thought she might have gone to look at the party, but then... I saw the handsome note on her pillow. I screamed and screamed. I couldn't stop. Did you notice anything unusual before that? I was with Daisy all evening. Finally, she fell asleep. I didn't see anyone else or notice anything in particular. Do you have any idea who did this? No. I can't see who could have done such a horrible thing. The Armstrongs are such good people. Like my own family. Thank you for giving me your statement again. I'll get back to you if I have any questions. I won't be far. Okay, I have Suzanne's statement. But her answers need some checking. A toy train. Now here I am on a real one. Nothing shocks me here. Score. One for the good guys. This information does not correspond to what Suzanne told me. Suzanne said she left Daisy alone for five minutes, but Mrs. Armstrong says she stayed with Daisy for a while and Suzanne did not return. The detective gets it right. Did you see Miss Moreau during the party? I remember seeing her at some point, but otherwise, no. I was too busy with my guests. Wear the smile, shake the proffered hand. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? Her room is upstairs across the hall from... Daisy's. She seldom leaves it. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. Their fairy tale became a nightmare. Mrs. Armstrong, let me show you this. Daisy, my little Daisy. I miss her so much. How good it is to see her face. I can't imagine the pain you're feeling right now. She loved her little stuffed animal, Fluffy. She took him everywhere with her. The kidnappers took it as well. They didn't have to. That means they wouldn't hurt her, doesn't it? Every lead will be followed up. 
You have my word on that. Thank you. I shouldn't lose hope. Somehow. I know it isn't my case, but I just made a promise, and I mean to keep it. Tell me about the night Daisy was taken, especially anything about your daughter and Suzanne Moreau. Apart from seeing to our guests, I took a moment to check on Suzanne and Daisy in Daisy's room. Suzanne wasn't there, but Daisy was asleep. I sat with her for 10 minutes or so. Suzanne didn't return while I was there, but there's no reason for her to sit there all night when Daisy is asleep. I went back downstairs. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? She's in her room. Last door on the left. May I come back? If I have more questions? Of course. Anything I can do. Okay, the stories Sonia and Suzanne tell don't match. I should recheck my file and track Suzanne's movements. That is not exactly what Suzanne told me earlier. Suzanne was on the phone more than five minutes. Score, one for the good guys. If I understand you correctly, you left Daisy when she was not asleep? The party was very loud. Daisy was too wound up to sleep. I read her a motley mule detective story to try and put her to sleep. Daisy finally fell asleep, right before motley mule solved his case in the book I was reading her. I had to make a quick phone call, no more than five minutes. But when I came back, Daisy was gone. Are you sure you were only gone for five minutes? Five, six, what does it matter? It was very quick. You say you were only away five or six minutes, but Mrs. Armstrong says she was alone there more like 10 minutes. And the phone record shows that you stayed on the call for more than 30 minutes, way longer than you said. My mother is extremely ill. It's difficult for me. I may have lost track of time. When I came back, Daisy had disappeared. It must have been a coincidence. You have to be precise, Suzanne. A little girl's life is at stake. Why are you doing this? I didn't do anything wrong. I would never hurt Daisy. I need to check Suzanne's story. She's panicking. Why now? What is she afraid of? That's it. No rookie mistake there. The kidnapper places a ladder under the window to Daisy's room. Then he joins the party. Just one guest in the crowd. He somehow knows when Suzanne leaves the room, then sneaks upstairs. He opens Daisy's window, carries her down the ladder, and vanishes.
hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. The number you have called is not in service at this time. Please hang up and dial again, or contact your service provider. The number Suzanne called is not in service? A hospital? I spoke with Suzanne. She was phoning her mother. That's why you didn't see her when you went to check on Daisy. Yes, her mother. I tried to call the poor woman earlier that week, but the hospital said she's been in a medically induced coma for more than two months. Suzanne told me she called her mother, but she would have known her mother was in a coma. I should see if the Armstrongs can confirm what Suzanne told me. I should see if the Armstrongs can confirm what Suzanne told me. Ms. Moreau told me she called her mother. Well, why not? I believe they are very close. And the poor woman is not well. She needs some experimental treatment that isn't available yet in France. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. The number you called that night is no longer in service. I... I... I don't understand. That's... that's the number the hospital gave me to call my mother's room. You told me you were on the phone with your mother when Daisy was abducted. As we said earlier, I didn't pay attention and was on the phone longer than I said. But since my mother is very ill, she had to leave her home down, Lyon, because the treatment is not approved yet in France. She is in an hospital in Boston for a special treatment. I call her every night to check on her. When I came back, Daisy was gone. I'll never forgive myself. Are you sure you called your mother? Yes. Every night since she was admitted in December. Suzanne, I think you really care for Daisy. If you do, then tell me the truth. You can't have been calling your mother while she's in a coma. My mom really is in the hospital in Boston. She really is in a coma. I... I wasn't calling her. I was on the phone with my boyfriend. Noah. Why lie about it? Why are you panicking? Because he's gone. I haven't heard from him since the night of the kidnapping. I'm afraid he's somehow connected to Daisy's disappearance. That he was just using me somehow. But I swear I talked to him. Yes, for more like 30 minutes that night. So he couldn't have kidnapped Daisy at the same time we were talking. But he could have kept you talking so someone else could take Daisy. Yes, you can see why I lied, can't you? I was afraid you'd suspect me of having something to do with it. You can understand that, can't you? Suzanne, I want to believe you, but you've made it harder to find Daisy. Do you realize that? Oh my god, what have I done? What's most important is not what you've done, but what you do now. Go, I'll be back to talk to you. No more lies, Suzanne, for Daisy. No more lies. Noah. The name might lead us to that little girl. I am on this case now. Whether my captain wants me to be or not. An Eiffel Tower keychain, but no key. I expect Suzanne must have gone through a lot of tissues these past weeks. Small jewelry box. By the size, I'm guessing earrings. Why put a key in a jewelry box?
What's in the glass case? Oh, big surprise, glasses. A card from the florist. It's signed N. Hmm, that doesn't work. Hmm, that doesn't work. Okay, Suzanne, let's see what you haven't told me. I can see why Suzanne didn't tell me everything about this, Noah. It's clear when he disappeared that she realized something was very wrong. I imagine these flowers must have been beautiful. Who gave them to you? The gardener. They're getting pretty wilted, but I hate to throw them away. Tell me about your boyfriend. Have you been together long? My boyfriend? Why? He doesn't have anything to do with this. Please, Suzanne, the sooner you answer my question, the sooner we'll be done. His name is Noah Garretti. I met him at a Lunar New Year party in Great Barrington. He, he is a kind and caring person, although, well, I miss him. He had to go away on business. He should be back. Sympathy and support for the Armstrong family during this difficult time. Thoughtful, but never enough. Know anything about Miss Moreau's boyfriend? Her boyfriend? I know she went out with someone for a while there. More recently, I saw a man in a 4x4 who would pick her up on her nights off. He never got out of his car, just waited for her. She did seem to spend more time than usual on the phone these past few weeks. But she worked hard. We weren't going to begrudge her what free time she had. Since Daisy... Since the abduction. She keeps pretty much to herself. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. These tire tracks could well be from Suzanne's boyfriend's 4x4. The detective gets it right. Tread marks of a four-wheel drive vehicle were found outside the garden on the night of the kidnapping. Noah drives one, doesn't he? Where is he, Suzanne? If you know anything more about him, you have to tell me. I know what you're thinking, but it's impossible. 
He was very nice to me. He never did anything to make me suspicious. We went out to eat to the movies. Just like a normal couple, he's not the only man in the Berkshires who drives that kind of car. You really didn't notice anything strange about Noah until he vanished? He could get moody at times, as if he had a lot on his mind. You mentioned the Blue Lagoon. Why? I don't know. I never thought about it. I guess he liked the place. That makes sense. In your diary, you say that Noah took you to a cabin in the mountains on Valentine's Day. You read my diary? I'm sorry, but we have to find Daisy. We both want that. So yes, I looked in your diary. I... You're right. He took me to a cabin in the woods. I waited for him in the car. He came out after a few minutes. He was very sweet and apologetic, but he never explained. We went back to the restaurant for dessert. Did you ever go back to the cabin with him? No, never. So what made Noah drive all the way to a cabin in the middle of nowhere? He left her in the car. Why was he there? This is important. I know it is. I can use Suzanne's directions to the cabin and compare them to the map of the area I have in my car. Can you tell me anything about Suzanne's boyfriend? I know she dated our chauffeur for a while. There was someone else she'd met recently, but I don't recall his name. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. Thanks to the information Suzanne gave me, I should be able to find the cabin on this map. I got it. The cabin has to be here. I have to find that cabin. I hope I'm not too late. Okay, here is this famous cabin. Let's investigate. Hello? Is anyone there? Nobody. I can't just waltz in without a warrant. was too high to see through. That barrel is sturdy enough. I could climb on it.
It's Daisy's plush toy. If Fluffy is here, the kidnapper has been here. I have to get inside this cabin. Empty wine bottles. Somebody has been here lately. Ugh, an old hunting trophy starting to molt. Noah brought Suzanne to this dump on Valentine's Day? What a romantic. I'm not getting through this door by wishing it open. The broom isn't sturdy enough to force the door. A mall for splitting wood. Perfect for attacking doors. Broken door to investigate. No need for a warrant. Some boxes. I wonder what they were used for. Some people seem to have played here before. The stove is cold. Nobody's been here recently. A lot of tools. Hmm, I guess somebody noticed the cabin was about to fall down. That's a woman's hairbrush. Did Suzanne actually come in here after all? This bottle comes from the Blue Lagoon. It's fluffy, no doubt about it. A gold mustache. Thank you very much. The floor is scratched and worn in this area. Mm, the sofa must have been moved a lot. Damn, it's booby-trapped. If I move, it could go off, and that countdown tells me it wants to go off anyway.
That should do it. Wow, I wonder if that's how close it was. This would have ended my investigation right here. These rods are heading towards the canisters. It must be the trigger for the explosion. I smell a strong, sweet smell. Damn. I think these are filled to the brim with diethyl ether. Incredibly flammable. It looks like the kidnappers wanted to utterly destroy this place and whoever opened this hatch. A wooden crate? I... I have to open it. Oh no. Daisy. No. I called in my discovery of the body. Then there was nothing I could do except protect the site for forensics. The forensics team arrived an hour later, cordoned off the cabin with crime scene tape, and went to work, looking for physical evidence, fingerprints, testing for fluids, DNA, any clues science can uncover. They removed Daisy's body. The autopsy would take place in the morning. But I had one more stop to make. That night, I swore to find the monster who killed that child. Ratchet uh, on train s saw me? How? Daisy. She was awake? And then she collapsed again. I take the responsibility. She was weaker than I realized. Oh. Lie still while I examine you. Pupils dilated? I'm all right. You are far from all right. You have been heavily sedated. Your pulse is very weak. I... I have to... to finish my story. Ratchet can't escape again. Can't escape. Have no fear of that, mademoiselle. Ratchet will not escape. We must hear her story. This woman needs rest. I will let you know when she is recovered enough to continue. But I warn you, it will be some time. I understand, doctor. Thank you. I have completed my preliminary examination of the deceased. I think that it will interest you. Indeed it will. And I have other witnesses to interrogate. You are right. Let's not put this poor woman in danger. There will be plenty of time for her to finish her story when she has recovered. By all means, tell me the results of your examination. My 
little gray cells did not let me down. Can you estimate the time of death? Rigor mortis was advanced, but not complete. I estimate the death occurred between midnight and two in the morning. Hmm, that tallies with the witness statements I've collected so far. What is the cause of death? Multiple stab wounds to the upper torso. It's odd there are no signs of a struggle that might indicate one of the first wounds was enough to kill him. It seems that Monsieur Ratchet had taken sleeping pills during the night. Ah, that would explain the lack of defensive wounds. What can you tell me about the stab wounds? I counted twelve in all. One or two are so slight as to be practically scratches. On the other hand, at least three would be capable of causing death. The angle of the wounds is instructive. Most appear to have been struck by a right-handed person. But you see, this one, under the right armpit, it's not a deadly blow given the depth, but a right-hander couldn't have done it. It was most certainly struck with the left hand. So, our murderer is left-handed. No, it is more difficult than that, is it not? As you say, Mr. Poirot, some of these other blows are just as obviously right-handed. Could the assassin attack and then move the body for some reason before finishing? Monsieur Poirot, I can assure you that the body has not been moved. Well, then we are left with the hypothesis of a second murderer. Do you see another explanation? That is just what I am asking myself. Have we here a bizarre coincidence or what? Mr. McQueen and Mr. Masterman told me that Monsieur Ratchet didn't smoke. Can you confirm this? I can't say without a more extensive post-mortem. Thank you, Doctor. Excellent work under difficult circumstances. Please let me know when I may speak again with Mademoiselle Locke. Of course. Yes, that's certainly a good place to start. Yes, I have personally seen some passengers smoking. I just have to remember who they were. This is a tenuous clue at best. I still have more important interrogations to conduct. Yes, I suppose it's likely they will give me the list of who smokes what. That's the right answer. How is Mademoiselle Locke, Doctor? The vital signs are improving, but she is still unconscious. I understand. Thank you for looking after her. That was easy. Mm-hmm. 
Most of the passengers pass by the bar during the day. They eat, drink, write. Maybe I can use this information for my investigation. Adequate. Hmm, yes, it could work. He appears to be an observant young man and serves the passengers regularly. Good. Yes, if I ask them to write something trivial, they may do it instinctively with their dominant hand. Brilliant. Yes, I will remember which people use their right or left hand. Et voilà. Mademoiselle Debenham, I have a few questions for you. Of course. Let's start with your movements last night. There's little to tell. I went to bed and slept. Did you know the man who was killed? I saw him for the first time during lunch yesterday. Did you notice anything about him? Well, if I believed in auras, I might say he seemed dark. Would you mind writing your address on this paper for me? Not at all. That's it. Mademoiselle Debenham is right-handed. Do you recall what time Mademoiselle Olsen went to get some aspirin from Madame Hubbard? I remember glancing at the clock. She left our room just after 10.30 p.m. Was she away for a long time? About five minutes. That confirms what Madame Hubbard told me. Do you smoke by any chance? No, I never have. Do you own a scarlet nightgown? No, it isn't mine. Who's then? I don't know. What do you mean? You do not say, I have no such thing. You say, it isn't mine. Meaning that you know who it belongs to, am I correct? Oh, I see. No. I woke up this morning about 5am with the feeling that the train had been standing still for a long time. I opened the door and I saw someone in a scarlet kimono some way down the corridor. Her back was turned. It was impossible to see who it was. I understand. Thank you for your assistance, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle, I am sorry to disturb you, but I need to ask you a few questions. Are you the investigator? I am. We are lucky you are on the train. What do you want to know? I hear, mademoiselle, that you were the last person to see the murdered man alive. I do not know. It may be so. I opened the door of his compartment by mistake. I was much ashamed. It was a most awkward mistake. You actually saw him? Yeah. He was reading a book. And what did you do after that, mademoiselle? I went in to the American lady, Mrs. Hubbard. I asked her for some aspirin, and she gave it to me. I usually carry extra aspirin for the refugees, but I gave mine to a camp in Turkey. They needed it more than me. My little grey cells did not let me down. Did Mrs. Hubbard ask you whether the communicating door between her compartment and that of Monsieur Ratchet was bolted? Yes. And was it? Yes. And after that, what did you do? After that, I went back to my compartment, took the aspirin and lay down. That was around 10.50 p.m. Is there anyone else in your compartment? Yeah. 
a young English lady. Very nice, very amiable. After the train left Vinkovsky, did she leave the compartment? No, I am sure she did not. Why are you so sure, if you were asleep? I sleep very lightly. I am used to waking at a sound. I am sure that if she had come down from the berth above, I should have awakened. Did you yourself leave the compartment after that? Not until this morning. Do you have a scarlet silk kimono, mademoiselle? No, indeed. I have a good comfortable dressing gown of Jaeger material. Do you smoke, mademoiselle? No, I can't stand the smell of tobacco. Perhaps you will be so amiable as to write me down your address. With pleasure. Mademoiselle Olsen is indeed right-handed. This was a very interesting conversation, Mademoiselle. I thank you. If you have any other questions, I'll be in my compartment. Good luck, Mr. Poirot. I'll observe her instead. I'll keep an eye on them instead. Monsieur Fauché, may I disturb you for a moment? Of course. How can I help? It is, of course, about the murder of Monsieur Ratchet. Can you tell me your movements last night? I understand. Yesterday evening, I took a break at Vinkovsky Station with Hotaru. We then went to our quarters in the staff accommodations, a section of the luggage car. Freya was there, reading, and I went to bed right after. Freya is there now, I think, and Hotaru is in the kitchen. They can verify my story. What time was this? 11.30 p.m. or a bit after. The snow is beginning to fall heavily. I see. Thank you. Can you write your address on this paper, please? You want to pay me a visit? <laughs> Who knows, Monsieur Fauché? He is right-handed, there can be no doubt. Are you a smoker? I'm trying to quit, but yes. I'm now down to just one pack of cigarettes a week. If you are looking for a heavy smoker, you should talk to Hutaru. He is right-handed, there can be no doubt. Thank you, Monsieur Fauché. I'll come back to you if I have more questions. So, Poirot, I hope you are progressing in your investigation. I have not finished yet, but it is progressing, yes. I still have many questions that must be answered. I will report to you as soon as I can. Ah, Monsieur Maury. Would you have a few minutes to give me? I have some questions to ask you. Do I look like I can answer questions? The room is spinning. My head is about to explode. You were celebrating last night? Celebrating? When Freya always wins? Ah, oh, what am I saying? If you want my answers to your questions to make sense, help me recover. You see there, the magnet on the fridge. That is my special recipe. I call it my day after survival tonic. If you could make me my special tonic, I might survive long enough to answer your questions. Jean knows the recipe very well. He can help you with the preparation. Very well, Monsieur Mori. If I must, I must. I will make you your day after survival tonic. That's the right answer.
Missing half of the tonic ingredients. I have all the ingredients for Monsieur Maurice's tonic. I have to go and see Monsieur Fauché so he can prepare it for me. Hmm, it's locked. Well done. Right. I must admit I'm not right this time. Are you with nice? Think Poirot, that is not a good answer. Are you a smoker? Yes, I smoke. Good job. My little grey cells did not let me down. That's the right answer. cells did not let me down. Strange, this story. If Mademoiselle Olsen is such a light sleeper, why didn't she tell me about Mademoiselle Debenham getting out of bed? She even made a point to tell me the opposite. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. Monsieur Fauché, may I disturb you for a moment? Of course, how can I help? Monsieur Fauché, I need your help to prepare a cocktail. What is this phrase? This is music to my ears. What can I fix for you? A mojito? A gin and tonic? Or perhaps a martini? Shaken? Not stirred? <laughs> it's not for me, but for Monsieur Maury. 
Ah, his day after survival tonic. Unfortunately, I know it well. Here is everything that was listed on the magnet. Excellent. I can take it from here. Mr. Poirot, I'm uncertain about the lemon juice. Is it half a lemon or a full lemon for the recipe? Half a lemon. I can't remember if Hotaru prefers it with ginger or without. Do you remember? I can assure you that he will want the ginger. There you are, sir. Hotaru will be himself again. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, pardon this intrusion, Mademoiselle Olsen, but something you told me earlier confuses me. Oh, please, come in. How can you be sure Mademoiselle Debenham was in bed all night? As I told you, I am a very light sleeper. The slightest noise wakes me up. If Fräulein Debenham had gotten out of her bed, I would have heard her. I, I got up this morning around 8 a.m. She was sleeping soundly. Are you certain you would have heard her? Yes. Why are you asking? I spoke to Mademoiselle Debenham and she told me that she got up around five o'clock in the morning. She opened the door and looked down the corridor. It was then that she saw a woman in a red kimono. How do you explain that? I think I must have been sleeping very soundly not to have heard it. Oh, but does that make me a suspect? I am not accusing anyone, mademoiselle. Do not worry. I am just trying to determine what happened last night. Thank you for your testimony. Captain Arbuthnot, I beg your pardon, but could you answer a few questions for me? I'm grateful you found my ticket, Poirot, but now is not convenient. Hmm, I certainly didn't expect such a resistance. Here you go, Mr. Mori. I hope this will help you. Thank you very much. Please give me a moment. While this takes effect, it will be a while, I'm afraid. But I will not move from the kitchen. Since I have to wait, do you know where I can find Mademoiselle Nielsen? 
She is in the staff quarters in the luggage car. If the door is locked, John will have the key. Thank you. I will return. I hope you have a speedy recovery. Monsieur Mori told me that you are the one who has the key to open the luggage car door. I will need it. Yes, that's right. Here it is. Please don't forget to give it back to me. I will not forget, Monsieur Fauché. I have a favor to ask. Could you visit the passengers who are in their rooms and explain there has been an error with their allergy and diet form? But Monsieur Poirot, I made no errors. <laughs> of course not. Call it a computer error. Yes, it is possible. But even if I can see this is part of your investigation, I do not understand it. I would ask that you observe which hand each passenger uses. Ah, you wish to know if they use the right or left hand when they write. That is my intention. I will take on this mission for you. Excellent. It's open now. Hmm. Empty rum bottles. A deck of cards. I suspect they were reading diamonds and spades instead of books. Hello, Mademoiselle Nielsen. May I ask you a few questions? I don't have a minute. My career is ruined, and it's not my fault. But how did this terrible thing come to pass? My supplies, passenger luggage, our living space. There is so little room. I gave the cargo handlers in Istanbul strict instructions how to stack my crates containing the ingredients I need for my desserts. So as one box is used up, it can be discarded. And these fools of cargo handlers did not follow your instructions? Ignored completely. I have four crates that must be moved from there to here to correct the order they are stacked. But placing the wrong crate on top of a smaller crate will crush it, its contents, and my career. Calm yourself, mademoiselle. I understand. So, the problem is these four crates must be moved there, but carefully. Yes. I have to move these four boxes from this location to here. But there is not much space to move the boxes, and I have to be careful never to put a bigger box on top of a smaller one, or the smaller crate will be destroyed. The problem is clear. I shall assist you. a lifesaver. Or at least a dessert saver. Thank you, thank you. I will gladly answer your questions. Can you tell me your movements of last night? Last night after dinner, I stayed in the kitchen until 12.15 a.m. Then I joined Jean and Hotaru in our quarters. Then we... Then all of us read quietly in our beds until we fell asleep. A very studious staff. However, Monsieur Mori doesn't seem to have followed the same literary pursuit as the others. And these rum bottles, do they have something to do with his hangover? 
I rather think that you didn't just read last night. What makes you say that? The empty rum bottles. Were their labels part of your reading last night? My fault. I must have left them there before I put them in the bin. And these are straight from the bar. Our passengers must have drunk them. Mm, I have my doubts. But why would she feel the need to lie? I spoke to Monsieur Maury. He seemed to be quite hung over. He even asked me to make him his day after tonic. He blurted out, Freya always wins. Wins what? Looking around, it is clear you were gambling and drinking most of the night. You don't understand. It's late when we're off duty, but we need to unwind. And now there's been a murder? Yes, I admit it. We went overboard last night. But please don't tell Mr. Book. It's against regulations. We could all be fired. Mademoiselle, I realize your difficult jobs have been made more difficult. But as you say, there has been a murder. I must have the truth. Of course. I'm so sorry. It's not such a crime. I'll leave it there and check in with Monsieur Fauché. Would you mind writing your address on this paper? I'm asking everyone on the train for addresses, in case I need to contact them once they leave the train in Paris. I understand. Yes, that's it. Mademoiselle Nielsen is right-handed. Do you smoke? No, I never have. Thank you. Thank you for your answers, Miss Nielsen. You're welcome. You can never have too many of these. How are you? Mm, it's better. Thank you. Then may I ask you some questions? It will not take long. Quickly, please. I have hungry passengers to feed. Très bien. Can you tell me your movements last night? Oh, nothing special. When I went off duty, I joined Joan and Freya in a compartment. I read for a short while, then went to bed early. Reading? <laughs> I'm not sure you have recovered enough to tell me the truth. Don't waste what little energy you have recovered to lie, Monsieur Moy. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Poirot. You're right. It obviously wasn't reading that made my head hurt like that. But if you told Monsieur Book, it could mean my job. I will keep your secret, but I am investigating a murder. You must tell me the truth. Thank you. Please, write your address on this paper. My address? I don't see why. I think I hear Monsieur Book approaching. My address? Yes, of course. Another right-handed person. Not surprising, most people are. You are a heavy smoker. My job. It is very stressful. Would you happen to know who vapes on the train? A banana flavor? Oh, yes. The smell disgusts me. What is wrong with a good tobacco? I do not have time to answer that. Who is it? I've only seen one person who vapes. It's Captain Arbuthnot. Captain Arbuthnot, I see. Your testimony was invaluable to me. Thank you. Take care, Monsieur Maury. My palate depends on your good health. Here is your key. Thank you very much. My pleasure. About the little favor I asked of you. Aha, but of course. 
I was able to get new allergy forms from guests who were in their compartments. Monsieur McQueen, Monsieur Masterman, Count and Countess Andrani, they are all right-handed. I also asked Princess Dragomirov, but she had her assistant, Madame Schmidt, sign for her. She is right-handed as well. You have exceeded my expectations. Well done. Thank you, Monsieur Fauché. I'll come back to you if I have more questions. Captain Arbuthnot, I know that you are the only person on this train to smoke e-cigarettes. We found a vial of e-liquid at the crime scene. Will you talk to me about this, or should I pass on what I've learned to the police? All right. Come in if you must. I have just a few questions for you. Very well. Let's hear them. The young English lady, Mademoiselle Debenham, was at the Tocatlian Hotel. Perhaps you met her there? We exchanged a few words. Fellow Brits abroad, that sort of thing. Hmm. What can you tell me about Mademoiselle Debenham? Nothing whatsoever. We barely spoke. The director of the Orient Express, Monsieur Book, thinks the assassin is a woman. And that is enough to accuse her? She had nothing to do with this murder. How can you be so certain? The idea is absurd. Ratchet was a perfect stranger to her. She'd never seen him before. Ah, did she tell you so? Well, yes, maybe she did. She may have commented once upon his somewhat unpleasant appearance. If a woman is concerned, as you seem to think, to my mind, without any evidence, I can assure you that Miss Debenham could not possibly be implicated. Hmm. It is clear that the captain is defending Miss Debenham, a woman he supposedly doesn't know very well. What were you doing last night around a quarter past one? One fifteen? I believe I was still talking to that young American fellow, Mr. McQueen, the secretary of the man who was killed. We were in his compartment. He was a friend or acquaintance of yours? No, I never saw him before this journey. We'd hit it off at dinner, and the conversation continued into the early hours. Until what time was that? Until one forty-five or so. Then I retired to my room and went to sleep. There is nothing you can recall last night that in any way struck you as suspicious? It's nothing. A mere detail. Allow me to be the judge. Well, before returning to my room, I went to the lounge car to get a glass of water. When I was passing through the first-class corridor, I noticed that the door, which is just after your room, 201, was not quite closed, and the person who was inside peered out in a furtive sort of way. Then he closed the door quickly. I know there's nothing in that, but it was the furtive way it was done that caught my attention. Struck me as a bit odd. I understand. Thank you for letting me know. Could you write down your address here, please? My address? If you insist. This man is right-handed. Is this e-cigarette liquid yours? What flavor is it? Banana. Well, that is awkward. That's my flavor of choice. 
But I have no idea what it was doing there, whatever. Can you explain how it ended up there? I have no idea. I never entered the man's room, Poirot. That's the truth. Thank you, Captain. You're welcome. Not good. Captain Arbuthnot is the only passenger to smoke an e-cigarette. Even if this liquid in Ratchet's room is a solid clue, he has an alibi. I cannot accuse him without any other proof. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. So, Poirot, I hope you are progressing in your investigation. There is no trace of the murder weapon on the train, as yet. The killer could have hidden it anywhere. It must be somewhere. Indeed, as you say, it must be somewhere. According to Dr. Constantine's report, the stab wounds were made by at least one right-handed and one left-handed person and with different strength. For the moment, everyone I have checked is right-handed. It is impossible to draw any conclusions as yet. However, I still have a few people to interrogate, notably the Russian princess. You still have many avenues to explore? Indeed, the case is far from over, mon ami. I identified the person responsible for the bottle of liquid for the vape found at the crime scene. So, this is our culprit? Do we hold him? No, unfortunately this bottle belongs to Captain Arbuthnot, but he has an alibi, confirmed by Monsieur McQueen for the time of the murder. Monsieur Book, Monsieur Poirot, Michel, calm down. But it's Mrs. Hobart. She says she found the murder weapon in her room. She's very upset. Let's go, Poirot.
I demand to be allowed to leave this train. Madame, we are in the mountains, trapped in a snowdrift. Stating the obvious, there is a murderer among us. He had the audacity to hide his weapon in my room. Please, Madame Bird, take a deep breath and tell us what occurred. Where did you find the knife? I... I... I wanted to get a handkerchief from my purse, and when I opened it, I... I saw it! A bloody knife! Am I next to be murdered? I very much doubt the murderer would give you his weapon. What do you mean? Madame, he would have used it. <gasps> oh, my heaven! Did you touch the knife? Of course not! What a question! I will take that as a no. Is this knife the real murder weapon, or is it a red herring? Mrs. Hubbard is distraught, Poirot. I should stay with her. Please go on without me. I have every right to be distraught. Thank you, Mr. Book. There is a quick way to show. I, I have estimated the depth of the wounds. You can easily find the depth, depth of each wound by carrying the wound. There are five of them that I am not sure about. Test them, them, and then we will compare our results. I will do as you say, sir. I must admit I'm not right this time. I do not think that's the right answer. No, 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 not good. I must admit I'm not right this time. This is wrong. But I never think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. think that's the right. I must admit I'm not right this time. Et voila. What do you think, Doctor? Is this knife really the murder weapon? There can be no doubt. You found the same depths as the estimates I made during the preliminary autopsy. I can assure you that you hold in your hands the weapon that took Ratchet's life. Thank you. I feel way better now. The rest gave you time to sleep off most of the effects of the drug. I'm still a bit groggy. That's understandable. Are you able to continue your story now? Yes. Yes, I think so. Where was I? You were explaining how you returned to the Armstrong house to tell them their poor little child was dead. Yes, that's it. I felt helpless. My part in the case was officially over, but I knew I couldn't let it go. Daisy deserved justice. Two days later, I returned to the Armstrong house to tell them Daisy would be released soon for burial. I was angry with myself that I couldn't bring them better news. I wasn't prepared for more tragedy.
Hello, Miss Moreau. I'm here to see Colonel Armstrong. Good morning, Detective. Colonel Armstrong is upstairs. He... he isn't well. Good morning, Colonel Armstrong. Is your wife here? Here? No, Sonia is not here. Always one step behind. She died of a miscarriage last night. My wife, Daisy, and our baby. My whole family is gone. I... I'm so sorry. I came straight here this morning. I received word that you can arrange for Daisy to be returned to you for burial. I didn't know. Well, then, now you don't have to come back. I can arrange for Daisy, my wife, and our unborn child to be buried all at once. Very efficient. Being a military man, I can appreciate efficiency. I know how hard this must be for you. No, you don't know. I don't want your sympathy. I want you to do your bloody job and catch the creature that did this. I know you won't believe me, but I swear to you. I will find who did this. If it takes me to the far corners of the earth, I will find them. Then go. Please go now. Go find them. The house that once held the laughter of a child now feels so empty. I'm not giving up. I'm a part of this case. Or the case is a part of me. All units, Hike is in the vicinity of the cabin where Daisy Armstrong was found, spotted a pickup truck drive through the barricade tape, and then head up the dirt road toward where the subject cabin is located. Any car nearby who can respond? Unit 28, we can respond, but we're a ways away. Dispatch, this is 11. I'm on it. Copy that. 11, you're good to go. Copy that. Okay, there's the pickup. Let's see who ignored our barricade tape. Eleven here. I'm at the cabin. Someone has broken in. Are you requesting backup? Not yet. I'm going to take a look around. Copy that, Eleven. An individual has entered a police secured area. I have to stop him first. Footprints. A forensics evidence identification marker. Forensics had to go through this place with a fine tooth comb. He's not here. Three, eight, ninety-two. Oh, when the poor deer was killed. A forensics evidence identification marker. Duct tape to silence Daisy's screams. Damn it, Daisy. I will find whoever did this to you. Don't shoot, officer. I'm on your side. Sir, keep your hands where I can see them. Sure, no problem. Sir, this is a crime scene. Who the hell are you? I'm a reporter. Boston 6 News. You can get us on cable even here in the mountains. They haven't heard of crime scene tape in a big city like Boston? All right. That wasn't my best move. I got all excited. I didn't expect to find the place deserted. 
It was hard to resist. You should have tried harder. I'm placing you under arrest. You should be thanking me. Look what you apparently missed and I found. We'll get to that, but you're going to answer some questions first. I'm more used to asking questions, but fire away. Who are you exactly? I'm Michael Clark, journalist for Boston 6 News. Off camera, but someday I'm going to be anchor. You just wait. Do you have a way to prove that? My press card's in my truck. What are you doing here? You should know a crime scene is off limits. I'm investigating the Daisy Armstrong kidnapping like you. Does the pickup parked in front of the cabin belong to you? Yes, indeed, it's mine. I'll check. Show me your hands. I'm going to cuff you. I'm sure we can work out a deal. Put your hands in front of you. Aren't you going to read me my rights? You have the right to remain silent. I really wish you'd exercise that one. Dispatch, this is Eleven. I intercepted a suspicious individual at the crime scene. I'll check to determine how badly he's compromised it. Then I'm bringing him in. Copy that, Detective Locke. Clark's press card, and the phone number of the newspaper is on it. Ah, good. I can give him a call. Candid photos of the entire Armstrong family. A reporter just doing his job. Or something else. Hmm, the glove compartment is closed. <laughs> Car keys in the sun visor. A classic hiding place. Well, at least on TV. Clark's driver's license seems to be in order. The vehicle registration is not in the name of Michael Clark or a rental company. Telephoto lens. Not so surprising for a journalist. That doesn't track. That's it. No rookie mistake there. Hi, I'm Detective Joanna Locke, Berkshire Police. I'd like to speak to an editor, please. One moment, please. Hello, Detective Locke? This is Abby Wilson. I'm a senior editor. What can I do for you? Does a man named Michael Clark work for you? Yes, he does. Why? When was the last time you heard from him? Oh, it's been at least seven or eight months. That's not unusual. He works in the field? Yes, Michael Clark is what we call a stringer. He works as a freelancer. Comes up with a story we can use, we pay him. Then we don't hear from him again for several months. What kind of stories does Mr. Clark write? Mr. Clark is an investigative reporter. Mostly crime stories, to tell you the truth. He comes up with some pretty macabre stuff some of the time. Is there a problem? Or a story? Do you remember what the last case he investigated was? It was a murder case. 
The victim was a millionaire named James Miller. He was called the Frozen Fish King of Gloucester, Massachusetts. His body turned up in one of his nets. Or, rather, most of it did. Ah, well. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. You've been a great help to me. Pleasure. I hope he's not in trouble. He can be a little pushy, but he's a good guy overall. So what's he working on now, Detective? Are you sitting on a story? Thanks again. I knew I could do it. I can always use safe cracking as a career move. There. Now let's see what secrets you're hiding. What the hell is that gas can doing here? This blueprint. It looks like the bomb in the cabin. The kidnapper built the bomb here. This bunker looks like it's as old as the cabin. Everything is falling apart. No, doesn't work. Now what? I have to turn the power back on to open this magnetic door.
the cap's been damaged and some gasoline has leaked out. Hmm, no, it doesn't work. Let there be light. Perfect, it works. February 24th, the day of the kidnapping. They knew about the party and everything. Yes, I knew I could do it. I can always use safe cracking as a career move. An expensive looking pen with the initials JM? What's its story? It's Daisy's hair clip, the same as the picture I saw at the Armstrong house. That looks like a hair caught in the band around the money. Forensics will tell me for sure, but that doesn't look like Daisy's color. These get locked up again until forensics get here. I'll secure the bunker for forensics. Progress at last. I don't need to talk to the suspect right now. I don't need to talk to the suspect right now. The gas can I found in the bunker would match this outline perfectly. Okay, time for forensics to attack that bunker. And Clark? He's too sure of himself. I need to get him into an interrogation room and find out what really makes him tick. I know my rights. You can't keep somebody locked up in a car like this, you know. You wouldn't do it if I was a dog. 
Do they have bathrooms at the station? I have the right to make a phone call, Detective whatever your name is. That phone is an outside line. Hello, boss. It's Michael Clark. I'm still on the Armstrong kidnap, but there's a small problem. I got caught being someplace I shouldn't be. I'm at the police station. No, I'm not under arrest. Just questioning. Fire me. Why? The station's integrity? You're kidding me, right? If you think I've screwed up that badly, then fire me. Got that? Fire me. Yes, do it. That didn't go well. I think I got my point across. What happens now? Go ahead. Then we'll have a chat. An extra computer so I don't have to go all the way out to my desk. I'll add these to the file. Anything that will erase Clark's smile. The only comfortable chair in the whole station. But there's no time to rest. Case files. A lot of them for our tiny town. This is all a game to him, and he doesn't expect to lose. Now that we've taken your DNA, we can begin. Interview of suspect Michael Clark, 6 p.m., March 30th, 2019. This interview is being recorded. By elves behind the mirror, no doubt? You were arrested at a crime scene where you damaged police barricade tape. I'll pay for a new roll. That's a Class A misdemeanor, and it carries a $500 fine. Oh, that's unfortunate. To begin with, where were you on the night Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped? I was watching TV in my motel room but I had my police scanner on. I heard the first reports that the little girl was missing. No way the police at the scene were gonna let me get close. I set my alarm so I could get on the story first thing in the morning and tried to sleep. It was difficult. Can anybody confirm where you were? No, afraid not. I was alone and sleepless, a sad combination. And I realized a bad alibi. Let's move on to the gas cans and what we found in your pockets when you were brought in here today. That sounds exciting. In addition to the gasoline in the back of your pickup and another in the bunker, you had a lighter and gloves in your pockets. You were going to set fire to the bunker and every scrap of evidence inside. Where to begin? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I wasn't planning to use these things to destroy the crime scene. I've been around crime scenes my entire career. I brought the gloves so as not to contaminate it with my fingerprints. The gas can in the back of my pickup, I use it to put gas in the truck. Gas stations are few and far between in your mountains. I didn't know there was a gas can in the bunker. If that's true, I did you a favor. My arrival obviously scared off somebody planning to burn everything. Do you also have an excuse for your lighter? The lighter? I'm trying to quit smoking. I use the lighter as a reminder not to start again. You say you're a journalist, a stringer for Channel 6 News in Boston. I sell my stuff to lots of media outlets. Your camera was in your pickup. You didn't want to take pictures of the crime scene? I like to get the lay of the land. Once I see the story I want to tell, then I start documenting it. I don't know any journalist who works a case without their camera close at hand. He thinks he's invincible. I need to play his ego. That's the key. What are you doing in the Berkshires? And what is your connection to the Armstrong case? For the past few months, I've been working on a big case. Boston 6 News was looking forward to my next story. The Armstrongs have been on my list of potential targets for a long time. 
I changed gears when Daisy was kidnapped and started investigating the Armstrongs. So you just stumbled on a major kidnapping story during your stay in the Berkshires. Yeah, I was researching PCBs in the river for crying out loud. Then, wow, the Armstrongs. That's not a Science Sunday report. That's a lead. Sometimes you just get lucky. Your camera in the pickup. There were photos of Daisy from before she was kidnapped. The Armstrongs are a famous family like the Kennedys or Hollywood couples. Gossip sites love them. People want to see how they live. I started out just stealing candid shots. Paparazzi live on getting that one exclusive shot. Steamy, intimate, whatever. Then when the kidnapping happened, I realized I was here first. What an opportunity. And I jumped at it. You have an answer for everything. You're not very good at this, are you? How long have you been on the job? Long enough to put you away for life if you killed that little girl. Let's start with why you went to the cabin. If the police were interested in it, I was interested in it. That pickup of yours, that's a very nice ride. Especially for a stringer who only gets a few stories on the air. How can you afford it? When Boston 6 does use a story, they pay okay. That truck is top of the range. How much did it set you back? Fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000? When I have to, I do what everybody else does. I take out a loan. How about you, detective? You got a loan on your car? He's enjoying himself. I need to throw him off balance somehow, surprise him into making an error. Explain to me again how you got to the crime scene. I listened in on the police radio frequency. Anybody can do it with a scanner. I headed for the crime scene in my trusty pickup, like I've done for years. After the forensic team left, I needed to see the crime scene for myself. I got to the bunker just before you arrived. You said you've been driving that pickup for years? You heard right. Thanks to it, I never miss a story. You say you've been using your pickup for years, but the title certificate is not in your name. The truck belongs to somebody named Stephen Baker. Okay, I don't get why the pickup is so important to you, but I guess my ego made me say that. Yeah, the pickup was lent to me by a friend. I couldn't afford it even with a loan. I think you stole it, Mr. Clark. You needed a pickup like that for our mountain roads, so you stole that one. Try proving it. But while you run off on some wild goose chase, you can't hold me. I know that Clark is lying. I need to reconstruct the whole sequence of events in order to understand what happened. I did something wrong. Hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. I'll tell you what really happened. You waited until forensics left and arrived in your probably stolen pickup. You grabbed a can of gasoline from your truck. You then went into the cabin to check if Daisy had been found. You then went straight to the bunker to see if it had been discovered, planning to set it on fire and destroy all the evidence inside. Before you could start the fire, you heard me arrive. So you hastily left your gas can and closed the hatch. You didn't think I could open the bunker. If I hadn't found you, I expect you would have burned down the cabin too. I'm not gonna make fun of you, detective, or how you handled my interrogation. 
you're obviously very new at this. I swear I'm telling the truth. I didn't know the bunker was there until the moment you showed up. I seem to have trumped your entire police force. When I get the DNA results from the bunker, we'll continue this conversation. You have no concrete evidence against me whatsoever. The lab results will be in soon. You won't get away with this. See that call? That's your arrest warrant and a one-way ticket to prison. I'll be right back. Hello, sir. I think I found the man who kidnapped Daisy Armstrong. I'm interrogating him now. Hold on, Detective Luck. I have some bad news. Someone set fire to the cabin in the bunker. The fire department is on the scene, but they say it's too late. Th that's impossible. My suspect has been in the interrogation room with me all evening. We can't hold him. Suzanne Moreau. Her fingerprints are on the wine bottle found in the cabin. We also found an unknown person's fingerprints, but they don't match your suspects. Sir, with all due respect, I'm convinced Michael Clark is involved. Detective, I'm cutting you some slack already. But we cannot hold your suspect simply because you're convinced he's guilty. We have evidence that Suzanne was working with an accomplice, Noah Garrity. I order you to release the reporter and arrest this Moreau. L let me just check my last lead. The DNA analysis of the hair found in the bunker safe. The results just came in. I know how hard this is. I... Okay. Get the DNA results. Detective Locke, I will give you one hour maximum. Then you close the file and arrest Suzanne Moreau. Thank you, sir. an extra computer so I don't have to go all the way out to my desk. Who did you call earlier? An editor from the Boston Six News. An editor you repeatedly said should fire you. That was your accomplice, wasn't it? You were telling him to start the fire. An accomplice? I know it was Noah you called. I'm saying nothing more without the presence of my lawyer. Stay right where you are. I'm not done with you yet. Wow. Do I hear grounds for a lawsuit? Some poor innocent woman is being accused instead of you. You set her up, didn't you? You have to let me go, detective. All I need is one more phone call to the lab. I know it's you and I'm going to prove it. Hello, this is Joanna Locke. I need the results of the DNA test I asked you for. Hi, detective. Sorry, we only have the DNA sequence. We haven't had time to compare it with the suspects yet. It'll take seven more hours. I'm sorry, but you are not the only one on the waiting list. Send your analysis to my computer in the office. I'll do the comparison myself. I need authorization. I have a murderer who is going to walk free unless I get those results now. Fine, we'll send it to you right away, but I'll have to log this. It's my last chance. I don't understand. I was sure it would be Clark's hair. I'll have to let him go. You can leave. Sorry it didn't work out for you, detective. Maybe you should consider a career change. We are not done. Oh, but we are, my dear. We are done. I had no choice but to return to the Armstrong house to arrest Suzanne Moreau. The arrest warrant for Suzanne Moreau. Suzanne was set up by Clark and Noah. 
They are the kidnappers, but I'm not giving up. When Suzanne comes up for trial, I will fight for her defense. But for now, the district attorney is in charge. If I want to stay a detective, he always has the last word. Hmm, the door is wide open. How strange. Hey, is anyone there? Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau? This is Detective Locke. Miss Moreau, can you hear me? It's me, Detective Locke. You must get up now. Miss Moreau? Miss Moreau, can you hear me? Suzanne Moreau is dead. There are no traces of blows or injuries on her body. She doesn't seem to have defended herself from anyone. It appears Suzanne killed herself by ingesting all these drugs. Suzanne's diary is missing. Suzanne was telling the truth about her mother. She must have realized at last how she'd been used. The death of her mother would have been an additional shock, and the self-righteous court of social media was as quick as usual to try and convict her. She must have realized at last the death of her and the self. Her glasses are missing. I called the district attorney to inform him. This is Detective Locke, sir. I'm at the Armstrong house. Have you arrested Suzanne Moreau? She's dead, sir. Apparent suicide, but I need a forensics team. She killed herself out of remorse for her part in the crime. We don't know that yet. I'm calling forensics now, but I wanted you to know. What a mess. Stay on site until forensics arrive. Yes, sir. Standing by. The investigation was officially closed. I was certain that she was innocent, and Clark had been responsible for four deaths and then vanished into thin air with a million dollars. Dollars marked though, and not easily spent. I didn't care if the case was officially closed. I swore, Mr. Poirot, whatever it took, I would hunt him down. I waited for the forensics team, 
then went into the station to write my report. I was officially off the case. Thank you, mademoiselle. That obviously cannot be the completion of your story. If I might ask a question? Of course. Suzanne Moreau's boyfriend, the one who manipulated her and burned down the cabin, this was Ratchet? No, he was an accomplice. Clark, the phony journalist, was the leader. Michael Clark, the reporter, he was Ratchet? Absolutely. I was the only law enforcement official to question Clark. I knew this wasn't his first kidnapping. You looked for similar cases. What do you Americans call the MMOs? Means, motive, and opportunity. Yes, I looked for someone in plain sight. Someone on the edge of a kidnapping case. Someone in plain view, keeping track of the investigations. An innocent witness, a concerned neighbor, even another reporter. And eventually you found a name behind an alias. Yes, I found a name. Cassetti, the real name. The real name of the man you call Ratchet is Cassetti. This explains much, mademoiselle, but not all. It explains why she is our number one suspect. But not how she came to be on this train. Attends, she has grown pale. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. Excuse me, Mr. Poirot. I don't feel very well. You are exhausted and still feeling the effects of the drug. Stay with us, mademoiselle. One more effort. I need to know your recent movements. I snuck aboard the train. This I observed. You came directly to this room? Yes. Yes, and other than a couple of careful trips to the... the ladies yesterday, I never left this room. I didn't want to be spotted by Ratchet. Yesterday, I, I chatted with my roommate, Miss Schmidt, I think, here in our room. She brought me some dinner. I got very sleepy and nodded off. And now she nods off again. Is this a joke? She must be faking so we can't interrogate her further, Poirot. No, Book. She really seems to have fallen asleep again. It is my fault. She must have been given a dangerous dose of sleeping pills last night. The effects should wear off soon, I hope, but I am afraid asking her to tell us her story was too much for her. Pinch her, Poirot. She's faking. Her eyes are dilated. She is not faking and there will be no pinching. Dr. Constantine, please stay with her. Monsieur Book, ask the other passengers to gather in the dining car. There are still many questions I need to ask. But all of them together? Won't someone overhear your questioning the others? I will speak softly because I am trained to do so. They will speak softly because they want to. Very well. I will do as you say. I hope we will be leaving soon. I hope we will be leaving soon. I should go and interview the passengers in the restaurant car. The passengers who agreed to come and talk to you are assembled, Poirot. Mr. Masterman is already here to answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. Sit down, Monsieur Masterman, please. Thank you. Does the name Cassetti mean anything to you? No. Should it? Have you heard of the Armstrong kidnapping case? Of course. It was all over the news a few years ago. Your employer's real name is Cassetti. He was the man behind that kidnapping. Mr. Ratchet was... He murdered that poor little girl? 
Mr. McQueen, the man you worked for is a kidnapper named Cassetti. What? <laughs> what kidnapping? He murdered his victim, a child named Daisy Armstrong. The Armstrong kidnapping? You had no idea of Monsieur Ratchet's real name? Damn, skunk! Why are you so upset? My father was the district attorney who handled the case, Mr. Pryor. I saw Mrs. Armstrong more than once. She was a lovely woman, so gentle and heartbroken. If ever a man deserved what he got, Ratchet, or Cassetti, is the man. He didn't deserve to live. Madame Olson, have you heard of the Daisy Armstrong case? No, I've never heard of it. It was only two years ago. It was famous. Maybe so, but it was not famous in Spain, where I have been helping the refugees from Africa. You've never heard the name Daisy Armstrong? No, never. Daisy Armstrong? No. 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 Yes. It was all over the English tabloids before I went to Jordan. A horrific crime that claimed the lives of an entire family and their wrongfully accused nanny. That's right, isn't it? Quite so. I thought the culprit had been punished. Some might say that the culprit was punished last night. Oh, my heavens. May I ask you a few more questions? Yes. Yes, of course. You read about the crime, as you said, in the tabloids. Yes, that's right. For weeks, news of the royal family was eclipsed. Have you ever been to the United States, mademoiselle? No, never. Jordan was really my first trip abroad. You were in Jordan? Yes, I was an English tutor there to the children of a high official. Until recently. What is your relationship to Captain Arbuthnot? Who? A former soldier traveling with us. You must have met him. Ah oh, yes, I met him on the platform in Istanbul. We only had a brief exchange of pleasantries, nothing more. British Reserve and all that. Ah, the British Reserve. Yes, with this I am familiar. Are you sure everything you have told me is accurate, Mademoiselle Debenham? Of course. Mademoiselle, I know that you met Captain Arbuthnot at the Tocatlion Hotel. You were spying on me. I am very attentive to my surroundings. It helps in my profession. I... well, it's your word against mine. I had occasion to be of some assistance in recovering Captain Arbuthnot's train ticket. While searching his room, I also discovered one of your earrings. Whatever your relationship may be to the good captain, I doubt it has anything to do with British Reserve. Hmm. You will not tell me your secret, mademoiselle? I... I can't. I... I don't know what you mean. Poirot, Miss Debenham's got nothing to do with this business. Nothing. Do you hear? Archie, stop! Captain, no! This behavior is unworthy of an officer and a gentleman. Leave her alone! Have you no honor? Archie, we should go. Captain Arbuthnot, I am certain you are a brave soldier. But you are a poor actor. The truth is that... Your relationship with Miss Debenham is beyond doubt, Captain. Your reaction was apparently that of a man trying to protect the woman he loves. I might understand that if your relationship was some cleverly disguised secret, but it is not. You make puppy dog eyes at one another at every opportunity. You cannot hide your love. Everybody knows. I advise you to stop with your accusations, Mr. Poirot. I'm going to escort Miss Debenham back to her compartment. Make of that what you will. 
The captain and Mademoiselle Debenham are obviously adamant about not revealing their relationship, but this scene convinced me there is more that is not so obvious. This murder has everyone on edge. In my 25-year career, I have never seen such madness aboard the Orient Express. I understand, my friend. The more we learn, the more perplexing this train ride becomes. But we have other clues to pursue. What do you have in mind? The broken watch on Monsieur Ratchet's wrist, for example. And the handkerchief found near the body. Who does that belong to? This little drama we have just witnessed has not put you off the scent. Far from it, my friend. Will you return to your watch over Mademoiselle Locke? Yes, I will. Dr. Constantine can probably use a break. Good. Au revoir, Poirot. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. I do not think that's the right answer. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. I must admit I'm not right this time. Hmm. Let me consider all the possibilities. Yes, there are only three possible hypotheses. The watch has been tampered with, or it is out of adjustment, or it indicates the time of the murder. I shall explore these last two possibilities before reaching any conclusion. If the watch is out of adjustment, it may be broken. There may also be another reason related directly to Ratchet. Maybe the watch is set to another time zone. No, 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 not good. The watch was not defective because the second hand is still moving. My little grey cells did not let me down.
That was easy. Well done. Adequate. If this theory is correct, then the murder took place at 12.15 a.m. I must interrogate all the passengers to see if any of them have an alibi for this hour. Monsieur, I am Hercule... I know who you are, Monsieur Poirot. What do you want? Answers to a simple question or two. All right, but quickly. My wife is quite ill. I would like to stay by her side. I promise. First of all, I imagine you know about the murder. Of course. The Countess is terribly distressed. Your full name? Rodolphe Adreni. Your home is? Budapest. And how do you come to be aboard the Orient Express? I am a Hungarian diplomat. My family has represented our homeland since the revolution from the Soviet Union in 1956. I was on my country's business in Istanbul. Business which I cannot discuss. And your wife often accompanies you on your diplomatic missions? Yes, and why not? Was there anything else you wanted to know? That's the right answer. Can you tell me how you spent last night? I was in our compartment with my wife. She went to bed early. I... I played a video game on my phone. Around 11 o'clock in the evening, my wife woke up and couldn't get back to sleep. She took a sleeping pill. As for me, I went to bed soon after that and slept straight through until morning. Have you ever been to the United States? I was posted to the Hungarian embassy in Washington for a year. You knew, perhaps, the Armstrong family? Armstrong? Armstrong. It is difficult to recall. One meets so many people. It was the kidnapping of a child, a very sad affair. The culprit was the man on this train who called himself Ratchet, the one who was murdered last night. Indeed. It sounds like justice finally caught up with him. Thank you for your time. Now, I'd like to speak to your wife, if you don't mind. It's impossible. As I told you, my wife is very ill. Thank you, and good luck with the investigation. Eh bien, the good Count does not appear to want me to talk to his wife. Hello, can I do something for you? Hello, Monsieur Hardman, I believe. You have heard of the murder? Cyrus Hardman, yes. And the fact that there's been a murder is all over the train. You do not seem very concerned about it, monsieur. It's not the first murder I've run across. I had no idea the selling of toys was so dangerous. I did overhear you mention at dinner that this is your profession. Toy salesman is a cover. I'm a private detective, just like you, from the US. I do not think that's the right answer. 
My little gray cells did not let me down. Were you on duty last night? You bet. I kept my door open a crack and I watched all night. No one entered that car who didn't belong there. Did you see anything in particular? The conductor, Michelle. He was there most of the time too, except for 15 minutes or so after we left Vinkovsky. He must have answered a call from Ratchet's room, then he was absent again for a while around 1 a.m. After that, he didn't move until 5. I did not expect to find another detective on this train. I just finished a job in Istanbul when I received an email from Ratchet. He hired me to protect him. Something you failed to do. I'm not happy about that. He'd received some threatening letters. I was supposed to watch his back, and yeah, something I failed to do. But he seemed to think he was in more danger when he left the train. He was traveling to Paris? I assume so, but I'm not entirely sure. Can anyone on this train confirm your identity? Yeah, that McQueen kid. Ratchet's secretary. Monsieur Hardman, have you heard of the Armstrong case? Armstrong? The kidnapping three or four years ago? Who hasn't? Why? Ratchet's real name was Cassetti. I have reason to believe he was the kidnapper. What? He killed that little girl? No, I didn't know. If I had known, I wouldn't have taken the job. Do you have any idea who was behind the threatening letters? I don't know his name, but Ratchet told me he was a small man. Dark hair, with a womanish kind of voice. Oh, thank you for your help. Uh, is this handkerchief embroidered with an H yours? Do I look like the kind of guy who would use a handkerchief like that? <laughs> thank you for answering my questions, Monsieur Ardman. Listen, Poro. I know I fell down on the job, but if you need help, any at all, let me know. I like to make it right. Well, it has been a while since I have seen one of those. I am not prepared to receive anyone. Come back later. Very well, madam. I'll come back later. But you will need to speak to me. So, my friend, have you finished your investigation? No, but I have managed to solve a few mysteries. Okay. I stay here to watch this young lady. Excuse me, Doctor. May I ask you a question? Anything that can help the investigation, Mr. Poirot. I wanted to know what your first name is, Doctor. My name is Robert. Why? To find out if the handkerchief embroidered with an H could have been yours. I'm a doctor, Mr. Poirot. Cloth handkerchiefs are a playground for viruses. I would not touch one. I hope your investigation is going well, Mr. Poirot. Ah! Monsieur McQueen, may I ask you a question? Anything I can do to help, Mr. Poirot? This handkerchief embroidered with an H. Is it yours? No, I don't use cloth handkerchiefs. Thank you. I won't bother you anymore. So, my friend. Have you finished your investigation? No, but I have managed to solve a few mysteries. Okay. I stay here to watch this young lady.
Madame Hubbard, may I ask you a question or two? It won't take long. Anything I can do to help. Have you misplaced a handkerchief recently? No, I don't think so. Why? We found a handkerchief embroidered with the letter H, so I thought it might have been yours. I'm sorry, but it's not. It may belong to Miss Schmidt, Princess Dragomirov's lady's maid. I believe her first name is Hildegard. It is a possibility. Anyone could be lying, of course. I thank you, madame. Monsieur, if I am to catch this murderer, I will need your help. My help? I am at your service, Poirot. You are obviously a devoted husband, Count Andrini. My wife means the world to me. There were questions in Budapest about a Hungarian diplomat marrying an American woman. It did not deter you. I would have given up my position for her. I would think it is universal. Are you married, Mr. Poirot? No. I fear marriage is not for me. But her condition, is it very grave? She is suffering about a vertigo. You understand? The room spins. I think Dr. Constantine could help your wife. There is a doctor on this train? I did not know. Where is this doctor? I think Dr. Constantine is in the lounge car. If not, perhaps the conductor can tell you where he is. Very well. I will find him. Thank you very much. Forgive me for intruding, madame. I am Hercule Poirot. I know who you are, Mr. Poirot. I overheard you send my husband on a wild goose chase. Your husband cares for you greatly, madame. I apologize for exploiting that fact. But the situation is urgent, and I need to ask you a few questions. Apology accepted. I realize you must speak to everyone. This horrendous murder. It's very upsetting. That is a beautiful music box. Please don't touch the music box. It's a fragile family heirloom. Your accent, is it American? Boston, perhaps? You have a good ear, Mr. Poirot. Yes. Born and raised in what we call the Back Bay. Are you in the diplomatic service like your husband? No, not officially. I was still in college when I met Rudy two years ago. I keep myself busy handling his scheduling, Travel, appointments. Ah, what is this saying? Behind every great man there is a great woman. That was the saying. Today one might reverse the sentiment as well, don't you think? Of course, I stand corrected. Dancer. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. No, 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 not good. I must admit I'm not. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. A handkerchief embroidered with an H was found at the crime scene. By any chance, does your first name begin with an H? No, my first name is Elena, with an E. Can you tell me what you did last night? Well, my husband and I went to dinner. Then we came back here. We went to bed around 10 o'clock. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't because of the shaking of the train. I suffer from vertigo. I finally took a sleeping pill and that did the trick. When did the train's motion prevent you from sleeping? Between midnight and 2 a.m. I know because I must have looked at my watch about 10 times. Hmm, I see. K. 
Come now, Countess. You are not telling me the truth. Why do you say that? The train stopped at 12.30 a.m. due to snow. So there was no shaking of the train. But you told me that it was the shaking that prevented you from sleeping. I don't know. You're confusing me. My vertigo. Madame, a man died last night. You can't talk nonsense just because you're sick. You are hiding something from me. How dare you! I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to find my husband. That was unkind, I know, but my strategy worked. I can now inspect this room in peace. These must be the sleeping pills that Countess Andreni took last night. closed. An engraving written in, I believe, Russian Cyrillic. It looks like a first name. An engraving written in, I believe, Russian Cyrillic. It looks like a first name. For my beautiful young ladies, Helena and Sonia. Helena with an H. It's Countess Andreni with an older girl. Faro! Have you no shame? Monsieur, I am afraid shame is not a very helpful emotion for a detective trying to get at the truth. What are you doing in our compartment? I am investigating a murder, Count Andreni. My wife is ill. My apologies, monsieur, but your wife seemed in perfect health when she left the room to find you. I do apologize, but I needed to search your compartment. You will regret this, Poirot. Please, Count. You aren't going to challenge me to a duel, are you? Countess, I'm afraid I took the liberty of inspecting your little music box. How dare you! The message in the medallion was addressed to you and Sonia. Sonia Armstrong, your older sister, the mother of Daisy, the murdered child. I am a Hungarian diplomat. You have no official standing here. You have no right to search- No, Rudolf. Let me speak. It's useless to deny what this gentleman says. 
I am Helena Goldenberg, the sister of Sonia Armstrong, and Daisy was my niece. The music box is a gift from my sister's godmother, a very close friend to my mother. We hid the truth from you when we learned that the man killed last night was the person who destroyed my family. I panicked. I didn't want to be accused. That is also why you lied about the H in your first name? Exactly. Your ferreting about looking for the H is obviously part of your investigation. If I found the anchor chief in Monsieur Ratchet's room embroidered with an H, I might suspect you had been there. A handkerchief? I don't have any handkerchiefs embroidered with my initial. To be honest, that sounds awfully old-fashioned to me. I give you my word of honor that last night, Helena never left her compartment. My wife is telling you the truth, Baro. I hope so. I'll let you rest. The matter of the H on the Anchor Chief still needs clearing up. But first, I should check the inscription on the back of the medallion. Natalia, Natalia. Would it be Natalia Dragomirov? She is the only Russian passenger on the train. In addition, her first name begins with an H in Cyrillic. That's the right answer. Enchanté, mademoiselle. You are Hildegard Schmidt? I am Raffol. And you, I know, are Herr Poirot. Correct. May I ask you for a few minutes of your time to answer a few questions? With pleasure, but uh, first may I ask for your help? <laughs> Why does this not surprise me? I... I don't know. I am at your service, Fraulein. My mistress, Princess Dragomirov, has asked me to open this traditional matryoshka doll. There is a trinket inside she must retrieve. Madame, in my experience, each Russian nesting doll simply pulls apart to reveal the next one inside. Indeed. Yet try it for yourself. As you wish. Oh, you are a gentleman.
the inscription reads, To my dearest friend. Oh, thank you very much. This doll reminds her of her youth in Russia. It was very hard under the Soviet regime, but thanks to her strength of will, she rose to be the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg. Even though she now lives in Berlin, it is said that the Kremlin still fears her. She must be a formidable woman indeed. You are her maid? I am her companion. I help her in her daily tasks, and I keep her company. Ah, forgive me. You will have heard of Ratchet's murder last night. Yes, of course. Everyone is talking about it. Can you tell me how you occupied your time last night? Just after we left Istanbul, I had tea with my roommate, Fräulein Locke. I went to dinner with the princess, and when I returned to my compartment, Fräulein Locke was already asleep. A little later, Herr Michel, the conductor, came to get me because Madame la Princesse needed my help. Her back troubles her. I massaged her for about an hour. Do you remember the time? Ah, I'm sorry. I do not, mein Herr. Have you lost a handkerchief embroidered with an H, madame? Oh, no, monsieur. I thought perhaps since your first name is Hildegard. It is not mine, I tell you. I could not afford something so nice. I have no idea who it belongs to. My apologies. I did not mean to alarm you. Thank you for answering my questions, madame. Monsieur Foscarelli, I would like to ask you a few questions, if you allow me. Ah, Signore Poirot, is it? I was wondering when you'd get around to me. Unfortunately, you find me on a mission of mercy. Hello, Monsieur Poirot. Sorry, we have a small problem. The orange juicer has broken down and I can't fix it. Mr. Foscarelli has kindly offered to help me. It isn't a car engine, but I am doing my best. Even with the two of us, we can't manage. Let me guess. You call upon Poirot to help. I'd be happy to answer your questions when we finished. Should work correctly now. Bravo! I should stick to automobiles. Well, now we can talk calmly. Monsieur Foscarelli, is it? Antonio Foscarelli? Delighted, Monsieur Poirot. You have, of course, heard about Ratchet's murder last night. Oh, naturally. It is all anyone is talking about. Have you ever been to the United States? Yes, it has been a primary market for our cars for the last ten years. You remember the Armstrong case? Armstrong? The name, yes. It was a little girl, a baby, was it not? Yes, a very tragic affair. Did you know that Cassetti the kidnapper was actually Ratchet? Oh, no. Then he deserved to die. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Can you tell me your movements on the night of the murder? I went to bed right after dinner, but I slept very badly. My roommate, uh, Mr. Masterman, had a toothache. Oh, he moaned all night. It woke me up several times. Did you hear anything or notice anything unusual? No, nothing that I can think of. I stayed in my bed all night. Well, thank you, Mr. Foscarelli. I'm sorry I couldn't help more, Signore. I remain at your disposal if you should need me. 
Thank you so much, Monsieur Poirot. I can put orange juice back on the menu. I'm sorry, sir, but I must concentrate on my baking. Sorry to bother you, Monsieur Murray. I have a question to ask you. Please make it quick. I have a meal to prepare. This handkerchief embroidered with an H, is it yours? No, I've never seen it before. Thank you. That is all I wanted to know. I hope your investigation won't interfere with today's menu. I am not prepared to receive anyone. Come back later. I'm sorry, madam, but a man has been murdered. I must ask you a few questions. You must have misunderstood me. I cannot speak to you just now. Madam, I know that Sonia Armstrong is your goddaughter. Come in, please. Please forgive my intrusion, madame, but I really must ask you some questions. Then ask. I'll answer if it pleases me. Hmm, we have not been properly introduced, yet I have observed her a couple of times, so I can already deduce some things about her. That was easy. I will first ask you about last night. Will you tell me your movements? I went to bed just after dinner. I read until 11, then tried to sleep. Later I woke. What caused you to awaken? I suffer from back pain, a consequence of old age interfering with an active life. I called Schmidt around 12.45 a.m to give me a massage. She did so until I fell asleep. How long was she with you? A good hour, I would say. I see. The first initial of your first name, Natalia, in the Cyrillic alphabet looks exactly like the letter H in the Latin alphabet. I'm Russian, Monsieur Poirot, and I was the head of a museum of antiquities in St. Petersburg for decades until I moved to Berlin recently. <laughs> I'm familiar with Cyrillic. This handkerchief is yours, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed. I lost it. 
It was found in Monsieur Ratchet's room. Can you explain to me why Madame Schmidt didn't identify the handkerchief? She must have known it was yours. Possibly to protect me. She is very loyal. Your next question will be, how did my handkerchief come to be lying by a murdered man's body? My reply to that is that I have no idea. That is not an answer, madame. It is all I am able to give you. I must tell you, Princess Dragomirov, I have discovered something astonishing. And that is? You are Sonia Armstrong's godmother. You make that sound like a revelation. I have never hidden the fact, monsieur. You knew Colonel Armstrong well, then? I knew him slightly. But his wife, Sonia Armstrong, was my goddaughter. I was on terms of friendship with her mother, the actress Linda Arden. Linda Arden was a genius, one of the greatest tragic actresses in the world. I was not only an admirer of her art, I was a personal friend. Very well. But this links you to the Armstrong kidnapping case. Elena Andreni is the sister of Sonia Armstrong, the late mother of Daisy Armstrong, kidnapped and killed by the man who was murdered on this train. Ratchet! Indeed. Was it he? Then justice has at last been served. Allow me to summarize. Do I have a choice? First coincidence, I shall call it. You are close to the Armstrong family, and the presumed assassin of Daisy Armstrong was killed while you were on board the same train. Second coincidence, your handkerchief happens to be found at the foot of the victim's bed. Third coincidence, one of the stab wounds inflicted on the body was by a left-handed person. You are left-handed. That is a lot of coincidences, Princess Dragomirov. Well, Monsieur Poirot, call it fate. If you report to the police your coincidences, they will laugh. A woman of my age and frailty has violently murdered a man? With how many potential witnesses who saw me doddering along the corridor in the middle of the night like Lady Macbeth? You are right, Princess. You could not work alone. Which means you have one or more accomplices. And it is only a matter of time before I find out who they are. I would appreciate it if you would remove yourself from my room and take your fantasies with you. Привет! Привет! This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. I must admit I'm not right this time. Think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. I do not think that's the right answer. No, 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 not good. Ryan Schmidt or Monsieur Michel may have drugged the tea that Mademoiselle Lop drank. Fraulein Schmidt or Pierre Michel could have drugged your tea. They are really the only two people on this train who could have done it. But why would either one do it? Mr. Poirot, I'm feeling much better. I'd like to bring you up to date to why I ended up on this train. If you are able, I would very much like you to finish your story. Very well then. After the Daisy Armstrong case was officially closed, I put out a standing request to the police departments in the Boston area for anything on Michael Clark. 
but he didn't turn up on their radar. I even set up an anonymous tip line for news about Clark. That's how I met Braid, a sketchy contact on the dark web, but they found nothing I could use. Four long years passed without anything new. Every day I looked at the evidence board I put up in my apartment bedroom. Then this morning, a police report landed on my desk that changed everything. I paid a visit to the police property room and took home a box full of clues. There was his name. Michael Clark. A bill from the power company with, I'm sure, plenty of excuses why my rates keep going up. Travel. For the discriminating traveler. Also for the overworked detective who never seems to have time for a vacation. Well, I can dream, can't I? Years of no new leads in the Armstrong case. And then this, Michael Clark, the sarcastic reporter, my prime suspect in the kidnapping, murdered four years ago? This is Michael Clark? He doesn't look anything like the journalist I interviewed. Michael, you have earned a place on my evidence board. So clever. All that evidence, and yet no DNA found. Fluffy. Daisy's plush toy. Suzanne's hair, so conveniently left in the cabin for us to find. It was planted. I knew she was innocent. The only fingerprints found on the bottle were Suzanne's. I knew it. The faces don't match at all. They are clearly two different men. I should run facial recognition on my computer. Okay, the real Michael Clark has been dead for years. Let's see if the photo of the fake Michael Clark matches someone in the database of known criminals. I've tried this several times in the past few years, but came up empty. Maybe whoever he really is, he's finally made a mistake. No, that doesn't look like him. That could be him, but he looks pretty different. No, no, this isn't it. Think! No, no, Joanna, that doesn't track. Yes. He seems different at first glance, but still, it's the same person. Good. Nice. He's changed his appearance a lot. Probably had some plastic surgery on his nose, but there is no doubt it's the same person. Let's see why he was arrested. Mr. Ratchet, you didn't just steal statuettes. What recent information does the database have on you? Frustrating. I have a name, but I can't find anything about him. But I know just who to call. Robot Defense League, we are monitoring this call. Hello, Braid. Long time. Oh, Joanna. Hey, 
help me assist you? I need you to search the dark web. Yeah, uh, can you narrow that down a little? Because, uh, it's pretty big and pretty dark out here. Could you find intel about a Samuel Ratchet? Samuel Ratchet. Got it. Bad dude? They don't come worse. Send me what you find by email. All right, hang on. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh uh-huh. Okay, nope. Nope, and... Okay. Oh, this might be something. I gotta do a deeper dive, but uh, you should find this interesting. Could be coincidence if I believed in them. Emailing details. Domo arigato, Mr. Robato. We're here to save mankind. Oh, it's a cookbook! Goodbye, Michael Clark. Hello, Samuel Ratchet, the man who stole your identity and your life. The Orient Express. I'm gonna print these tickets and put them on the board. I know I have to stop printing. It's bad for the planet. The Orient Express departs from Istanbul next week. Interesting. I'll put it on the board. I've read it probably 10 times already, but I can't get enough of it. Don't know why. Maybe because it helps me sleep? This is Ratchet's ticket. The person traveling with Ratchet has the same last name as my district attorney during the Armstrong case? Ratchet will be traveling on the Orient Express in a week. These tickets were all booked by McQueen. I knew it. He's the son of my former DA. He goes on the evidence board. This guy works for Ratchet, and if that's a coincidence, I'll eat my badge. Here's what Hector McQueen looks like. McQueen will be on the Orient Express next week. Next week, a certain Edward Masterman will be on the Orient Express. The DA resigned soon after the Armstrong case. It haunted him just as it has haunted me.
As Ratchet is alive, the dead man can only be Noah. Hector McQueen is the son of District Attorney McQueen. Not really my style, but I'll take it. The lab team found this keychain in the cabin, but they wouldn't have bothered to examine the keys once the DA shut down the investigation. The keys were just tossed in the evidence box along with everything else. It's too unusual not to demand a closer look. Hmm, a USB key. Let's plug it into my PC and see what nasty little secret it contains. Shaved off the Metro beard but I'd recognize that smug bastard anywhere. The man I interviewed four years ago posing as Michael Clark. This goes on the board. Maybe they needed to show the ransom to someone to check if the serial numbers were still on record. I'll print them and on the wall they go. Absolutely nothing on this cassetti. His driver's license is almost surely a fake. So, Ratchet's real name was Cassetti. Corelli will be on the Orient Express next week. I know that face. That's John Armstrong's driver. This tattoo is the same on both pictures. Damn, Ratchet is taking the Orient Express next week. McQueen, the district attorney's son, is too. Corelli, the Armstrong chauffeur, is too. It can't be a coincidence. McQueen and Foscarelli must have decided to take revenge and will undoubtedly attack Ratchet on this train. I have to be on the Orient Express to stop them. And above all, I must stop Ratchet. But I can't do it in Istanbul because there's no extradition treaty with the United States. Ratchet can never be judged in the U.S. without an extradition treaty. I'll have to wait until he's in Paris to have him arrested. Every compartment is taken for this special anniversary journey. Oh, it's impossible to find a ticket. What can I do? I could try to get on the train without a ticket, but I could end up arrested. And Ratchet could get away or get murdered. No, there's a better way. Let's find out who's traveling on the Orient Express. Time to call Braid. Braid, it's me again. I haven't found anything useful yet. I need one last favor. 
but it's a big one. Uh -oh. Can you find me the list of passengers of the Orient Express for that anniversary trip? Hold on. Jeez, their IT is surprisingly good. Maybe because of the big event. I found the list, but they sealed my back door as I was starting to capture it. Oh no. Whoa, calm down. I got one name. Female. The name I got before they kicked me off the server was Stacy Johnson. Do you feel like a Stacy Johnson? The question is, how is she going to feel about helping me? That's one you'll have to figure out for yourself. I gotta go back to weaving my magic on the web. Is this Stacy Johnson? Who's asking? My name is Joanna Locke. I'm a police detective. And I'm just an actress. Now what did I do wrong? Nothing. I need your help. I need to take your place in the Orient Express. Is this a joke? No way. Do you remember the Armstrong kidnapping? Of course I do. That poor little girl. I'm a police officer. I have a new lead that may help me find her killer. Wait, didn't they prove it was the nanny? I have found compelling new evidence. I've reopened my investigation. You know, I had my doubts about the murderous nanny. I played a nanny a couple of years ago in a slasher. I was killed in the first episode, but it got me interested in helping kids. Stacy, please, you say you help kids? Well, I joined a couple of associations who are trying to help underprivileged kids. If this little girl's real killer is still out there somewhere, I'd do anything I could to help. Getting me on that train will help more than you can imagine. So, you want my ticket for the Orient Express? But I booked it months ago. I was so much looking forward to this trip. I'll give you twice what you paid for the ticket. You think I care about the money? You still don't get it, do you? I'm hanging up. Goodbye. Wait. Stacy, I can tell you care about kids. Here's your chance to help put this beast in prison for the rest of his life. Think of the publicity for those causes you care about. Think about the kids. The kids? Yeah. All right. We'll do it for Daisy and the kids who suffer. I'll take care of changing the tickets to your name and send it to you. Get him. Make him pay. I will. Thank you so much. Stacy was as good as her word. I received the ticket. I called my chief to let him know I was taking my vacation time. I had coming. I flew to Istanbul. I was finally going to nail the monster responsible for Daisy Armstrong's death, Michael Clark's death, even his accomplice, and, I suspected, so many others as well. You know the rest. And that's how I found myself on this train on Ratchet's trail. The rest, you know. My identity is easily checked with the Berkshire police. Thank you for your detailed account, Mademoiselle Locke. In addition to giving us crucial details of the investigation, you have made it clear that there are many who might wish to see Ratchet dead. You have pursued Ratchet with, one might say, a vengeance. This could lead someone to believe you are a suspect. Mademoiselle, I admit that I... Well, that I... But your story is credible. I believe you are innocent. Yes, of course. That's clear. Thank you for believing me. I'd like to help in any way I can. Do not worry, Mademoiselle Locke. Already I see things more clearly. It's obvious. 
Whoever drugged you was trying to derail your investigation. You mean the person who did this to me is Ratchet's killer? Both Monsieur Michel and Fraulein Schmidt had the means and opportunity to drug you. While you get your strength back, I intend to interview them. Excellent idea, my friend. All this excitement has whetted my appetite. I'm sure Mademoiselle Locke won't say no to a good, invigorating meal. What? No. I want to hear what the conductor and Fräulein Schmidt have to say for themselves. It is my duty to ensure the well-being of the passengers. If Dr. Constantine has no objection, I will escort you to the restaurant car. On the contrary, some food will do her the greatest good. Well, I'm still a little shaky. Mr. Poirot, will you please keep me informed about what you learn? You may be certain of it. All that snow. Are you familiar with the concept of entropy, Monsieur McQueen? Oh, Mr. Poirot, I didn't see you. Entropy? Randomness in a system or something? Yes, unpredictability. Even the best laid plans can go astray, thanks to something as simple as... An unexpected passenger? Perhaps, or snow. I have nothing to ask them at the moment. I should leave them alone. Good evening, Fräulein Schmidt. May I disturb you for a moment? You asked so politely, mein Herr, but I do not think I have a choice. I wanted to let you know that your roommate, Mademoiselle Locke, is awake. Ah, yes. I'm glad to hear that. I was worried about her. Did she tell you what had happened to her? Unfortunately, she doesn't remember much, but we found a residue of a sleeping pill in her cup of tea. Since you two were alone together in your room when she drank it, who else but you could have dragged her? Must I point out I do not make the tea on this train? You should question the conductor or the kitchen staff. I know you have sleeping pills, Fräulein. I do have some. Do you think I'm the only person on this train who finds it difficult to sleep? I believe the Countess Andreni takes them. And I heard the Olsen woman thanking Mrs. Hubbard for a pill. That was aspirin. If you say so. I know you drugged Mademoiselle Locke's tea. Don't try to deny it. Nevertheless, I do deny it. Can I get you something, Monsieur Poirot? Everyone is so tense. Uh, an aperitif soon, Monsieur Fauché, with pleasure, when the matter is resolved. Not now! Not now! I have a dinner to prepare. Would you interrupt Michelangelo or Da Vinci? Good evening, Michel. Am I bothering you? You seem... Stressed. With everything that's going on, I must admit, it's difficult to be relaxed. Of course, I understand. 
especially since we know that Detective Locke's tea was drugged before it was served to her. Detective? Come now, Michelle. Surely you would have taken the opportunity to search her things and found her badge. Luckily, she woke up and was finally able to tell us her story. Otaru boiled the water, Jean made the tea. I just brought it. Sir, it could have been any of this stuff. Your defense is to accuse others? You have a network connection? No, unfortunately. It's just an automatic reminder to pay my rent. I always forget and my landlord complains. Pierre Michel had to be involved in the murder. The drugged tea, his post at the end of the war, and now I know why I know more than one of those people on the screen. Well done. Good. Well done. Et voilà. You are the father of Suzanne Moreau, Daisy Armstrong's nanny. My condolences on the death of your wife. What? But I... my wife... Enough lies. Suzanne does not bear your name? No. Suzanne's mother and I were divorced. Suzanne kept her mother's name. My most sincere condolences, Monsieur Michel, on the deaths of Suzanne and your wife. This job... I love them, but I was never there for them. Then, a year after the divorce, Solange became ill. Suzanne took her to this special hospital in the U.S. Got that job as Daisy's nanny. I understand your pain, and the reason that led you to drug Detective Luck. <sighs> we really can't hide anything from you, can we? Many have been foolish enough to try and keep the truth from Hercule Poirot. Yes, I admit, I drug the tea. But it was only to keep her quiet, until we... I could... But she reacted so much to the sleeping pills. She was lucky, as are you, that she didn't die. To be frank, there is one more thing that puzzled me. But I think I understand now. Monsieur Hardman was Suzanne's fiancé. Huh. I have the impression my whole life to you is an open book. Yes, Cyrus was my daughter's fiancé. I almost consider Cyrus as my own son. Of course, much more is clear now. I have been patient long enough. It is time to go and see what all the commotion is next door. Monsieur Hardman, excellent. The gods who watch over detectives must have trapped you here. Why didn't they watch over me? I'm a detective too. I, um, I was talking to Michelle about a, a leaky faucet, and I wanted to go out, but, um, you showed up. No need to invent some preposterous story. But really, I... Michelle has told me everything. You are the fiancé of Suzanne Moreau, his daughter. Oh. I see. Surely this is not a big surprise to you. No. Suzanne was the only woman I ever loved. And I failed her. I got into a spat. It was nothing. But I was too proud to apologize. We weren't speaking at all. Suzanne never really cared for that guy Noah. She would have forgiven me. If only... If only... If only... A common refrain between lovers who quarrel. I must check in with my other suspects to make certain I have all the pieces of the puzzle in my possession.
You're right, Mr. Book. This dessert is delicious. I'm glad we didn't wait for dinner. I promise the entree will be superb as well. Detective Locke, you are recovering well, I see. Yes, I should be helping with the investigation. Do you know who drugged me? It is early yet for conclusions. When I return, then we shall see. Do not worry, Poirot. She is in good hands. Otaru, Freya, and yours truly are looking after her. I wanted to let you know that your roommate... Ah, yes. I'm... I was very... Unfortunate. Must I point out you should fresh... Mademoiselle Locke could have died. Whoever drugged her must not feel any empathy for their fellow human beings, given the dose that Mademoiselle Locke ingested. She was close to death. <gasps> oh, my God. What did I do? I didn't want to hurt her. Just have her sleep for a few hours while we had time. We? Time for what? Time for what, Madame Schmidt? You think I feel nothing? Nothing? That poor, poor little girl. Indeed, that poor, poor little girl. Fräulein Schmidt is somehow connected to the Armstrong case. That's the right answer. Fräulein Schmidt, I have a certain reputation for sniffing out... I am not a murderer! Forgive me, but I was going to say brilliant chefs. You were the Armstrong family's cook, were you not? But... yes. I was the cook of that lovely, lovely family. I'm sorry, but I must ask you to give me some time to... to collect myself. It wasn't supposed to be like this, my darling, my poor darling child. I will give you that time, Fräulein. You have given me much more in exchange. Obviously, Pierre Michel and Fräulein Schmidt both drugged Detective Locke's tea, causing the overdose. No wonder she had so much trouble waking up. Time to report my findings to her and Mook. So, my friend, tell me, you have something new? Mademoiselle Locke, I know who drugged you. Fräulein Schmidt and our conductor Pierre Michel both admitted putting sleeping pills into your tea. This explains your overdose. They are relieved you are recovering. Michel drugged a passenger? On behalf of the company, I offer my apologies to you, Mademoiselle Locke. Michel will answer for this outrage. Both of them? I was pretty sure about Fräulein Schmidt, but I admit that I did not suspect the conductor. I have uh, uncovered multiple connections with the Armstrong case. Pierre Michel is the father of Suzanne Moreau, Little Daisy's nanny, and Monsieur Hardman was Suzanne's fiancé. As for Hildegard Schmidt, she was the cook of the Armstrong family. What a coincidence, don't you think? But it's incredible! What are the odds that so many people linked to that tragic affair ended up on the same train? About the same as you winning the lottery, my friend. I wasn't the officer who interviewed Fräulein Schmidt back then. So she couldn't recognize me here on the train. How could they know who I was? There were other passengers who might have. Or she may have seen you when you visited the Armstrong home. It is now clear to me that some of the clues to this elaborate plot were staged for my benefit. Thank you. 
That was easy. Some clues and information collected so far could lead to a hypothesis. The murderer boarded the train in Vinkovsky, killed Rachet, and then left the train immediately. How did you come to that possibility? Monsieur Hardman told me about a short man with a high-pitched voice who threatened Rachet. Imagine for a moment that this man, wearing a wagon lee conductor's jacket, killed him while Michel was on the platform at Vinkovsky. This murderer then hid the conductor's jacket in Detective Locke's room, then fled before the train left. Why choose Detective Locke's room? Why, indeed. Let me re-explain from the beginning. My little gray cells did not let me down. Mon dieu! Oui! That must be it! Everything fits so well! It fits too well, my friend. Other clues lead to a second hypothesis much more plausible. That was easy. So, we have multiple murderers, all related to the Armstrong case. The murderer from Vinkovsky was a fabrication to turn suspicion away from those on the train. They expected the investigation to be led by some small town official who could easily be misled. Um, Mr. Poirot? <laughs> Detective Locke, forgive me. You are an obvious exception. You tracked Ratchet with the tenacity of a bloodhound. Unfortunately for the killers, they not only had you to deal with, but now they had, and I say this with all modesty, the world's greatest detective, Hercule Poirot, dropped into the midst of their meticulous planning. Multiple murderers? Multiple detectives? Poirot, please take pity on me. Who is linked to this case, and who is not? My poor friend, I have gone speeding out of the station without you. I will continue. No, 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 not good. That was easy. Fräulein Schmidt, Pierre Michel, Monsieur Hardman and Monsieur McQueen are all linked to the Armstrong case. I also know that Sonia Armstrong's sister and godmother, Countess Andrény and Princess Dragomirov, 
are on this train. And finally, Detective Locke discovered that Mr. Foscarelli was the Armstrong chauffeur. If we add Detective Locke and Ratchet of the 12 passengers in that coach, nine have a connection with the Armstrong case. What next, Poirot? Or should I say, who next? It is time to summon everyone. Everyone? Even Dr. Constantine? The train crew other than Michel? Dr. Constantine, yes. I will need him. But we don't want the others as witnesses. I will see that their duties keep them occupied elsewhere. Excellent. I have always thought this moment in a case is much like Rodin unveiling the thinker before a captivated audience. A work of art. Have you not felt that way, detective? No, Mr. Poirot. I'm happy just to slap the cuffs on him. Well, there is some artistry in that as well, I suppose. Where would you like the unveiling, Poirot? Uh, the lounge? Perfect. Then I will gather all the passengers in the lounge. Monsieur Book, are the train crew locked in their quarters? Yes, they are. Then the stage is set for the final act. Ladies and gentlemen, I have gathered you together to hear my reconstruction of the murder of Samuel Edward Ratchet, also known as Cassetti. There is not one, but two possible solutions of the crime. I shall put them both before you, and I shall ask Monsieur Book and Dr. Constantine here to judge which solution is the correct one. Two solutions? Mr. Poirot, I am hardly qualified. Nevertheless, your assistance is required. Now, you all know the facts of the case. Ratchet was found stabbed to death this morning. He was last known to be alive at 12.37 a.m. last night, when he spoke to the wagon lit conductor through the door. His watch was found to be badly dented, and it had stopped at a quarter past one. Dr. Constantine, who examined the body, puts the time of death as having occurred between midnight and two in the morning. At half an hour after midnight, as you all know, the train ran into a snowdrift. After that time, it was impossible for anyone to leave the train. So, here is my first theory. The enemy, as Ratchet expected, joined the train at Vinkovsky by the door left open by Captain Arbuthnot and Monsieur McQueen, who had just descended to the platform. He was equipped with a wagon lead jacket, which he wore over his ordinary clothes, and a pass key which enabled him to gain access to Ratchet's compartment in spite of the doors being locked. Ratchet was under the influence of a sleeping draft. This man stabbed him with great ferocity, a dozen wounds in all. He left the compartment through the communicating door to Madame Hubbard's compartment. Yes, that's so. Scared me half out of my wits. The murderer thrust the dagger he had used into Mrs. Hubbard's handbag in passing. Without knowing it, he lost a button of his uniform. Then he slipped out of the compartment and along the corridor. He put the uniform jacket into Detective Locke's suitcase to cast suspicion on her. And a few minutes later, dressed in his ordinary clothes, he left the train just before it started off again, using the same means for egress, the door near the dining car.
That is the first hypothesis. But there's a second for that. We must examine the motive for the crime. Why was Ratchet killed? The motive is clear. Revenge, of course. Nothing was stolen. And we know that Ratchet had made many enemies. This was a premeditated crime, meticulously planned. Since the kidnapping and death of little Daisy Armstrong, which traumatized many people close to the family. Even when the police concluded that it was Suzanne Moreau, questions remained. Detective Locke continued her investigation, as did others. They became convinced the truth lay elsewhere. We now know who the real murderer of Daisy is. It is clear now that Daisy's killer was Ratchet, also known as Cassetti and Michael Clark and how many other names. But of course, many of you have known this for a long time. It is obvious that the 12 stab wounds are not a random number. Dr. Constantine's analysis revealed that some stab wounds appeared to have been caused by a right-handed attacker. Others indicated the knife wielder was left-handed. Some wounds were deep, more than one fatal. Yet others were not much more than mere scratches. What can explain these discrepancies? This leads us to an obvious conclusion. They are symbolic. Twelve stabs. Twelve! The same number as a trial jury in the United States. But not just a jury of twelve members condemning him to death, but twelve executioners as well. This self-appointed jury had meticulously planned for everything except... Snow. Snow. The avalanche that stopped us, as well as the presence of not one, but two detectives on the train. They had to improvise, to hastily add clues and false leads. The vial of vaping liquid incriminated Captain Arbuthnot. However, he had a solid alibi confirmed by Monsieur McQueen. Impossible then to suspect him. The conductor's jacket, found in Detective Locke's suitcase, was put there only to cast suspicion upon her. The time on Ratchet's broken watch was deliberately set to conceal the true time of the crime. This woman in a red kimono does not exist. I don't know which of the passengers it was. It does not really matter. It was just a performance, a charade to introduce another possible culprit to muddy the waters. All these false leads were intended for me. But I am Poirot. I understood the truth. We have a train full of suspects. It's time to identify who the real culprits are. Let's start with Detective Locke. Planting the conductor's jacket in her suitcase was an attempt to implicate Detective Locke, but she couldn't fake her drugged condition. Dr. Constantine can testify that the drugged tea incapacitated her for hours, and she had two relapses. Let us move on to Monsieur McQueen. When I told him about Cassetti, he looked very surprised that I managed to make the connection between him and the Armstrong case. He told me, but I thought we had... I think he meant. 
You thought you didn't leave any real clues linking the murder to the Armstrong kidnapping. Moreover, you insisted that Ratchet did not speak French when you knew I had heard a voice calling out in French that was supposed to be Ratchet. You took some pleasure in leaving me false clues, I think. It was quite annoying. But you told me yourself that your father was the district attorney who handled the Armstrong case. The case haunted my father. At first, he believed Suzanne Moreau had helped her boyfriend, Noah, to kidnap Daisy. Even though there were questions, it went unanswered. And a young policewoman refused to let it go continuing to find discrepancies, but never enough to reopen the official investigation. That police woman sits there. Her name is Joanna Locke. Then tell him. Tell him how in the end my father believed you, how he resigned a job that he loved, racked with guilt that he may have let that monster go free. He died young, broken, his faith in justice broken. That's what Ratchet did to him. Thank you for your honesty, Monsieur McQueen. Your father is one more victim of the man who called himself Ratchet. Now, I will turn to Ratchet's valet, Monsieur Masterman. Ratchet sensed danger close to him and naturally wanted to stay awake. You gave him sleeping pills without his knowledge. Once he was sound asleep, you could do what you had to do in peace. Sir, I'll tell you the truth. I was Colonel Armstrong's adjutant in the war, sir, and afterwards I was his valet in New York. I'm afraid I concealed the fact this morning. It was very wrong of me, sir, but I knew how suspicious it would look. Is that all you have to say? That's all, sir. Now, to leave no suspicious stone unturned, let us move on to Monsieur Book. What? Me? A suspicious stone? Book, my friend, of course you are not guilty. You did everything you could to get me on this train. What madness would cause you to ensure, and I speak with all modesty, that the best detective in the world could be present to witness your crime. But doesn't our friendship count as well? Most assuredly, but a murderer can wear all sorts of masks, including friendship. Let us consider our ever-efficient wagon-lit conductor, Pierre Michel. Your admission that you drugged Detective Locke immediately incriminates you, but the murder could not have been possible without your very capable assistance. Your knowledge of train procedures made the murder possible, and your position in the corridor of the train allowed you to be the perfect alibi for several passengers. And your motive? Suzanne Moreau. Daisy Armstrong's poor nanny, who was wrongly accused and committed suicide, was your daughter. C'est un foiré. He got what he deserved. My poor daughter has finally been avenged. My Suzanne. My child. Let's move on now to Monsieur Hardman, one of three detectives on this train. Monsieur Hardman, I think you are a real detective. But you were never hired by Ratchet. Your alibi was that you were watching the corridor to protect Ratchet, which, of course, you never did. You protected Pierre Michel. However, we just saw that his alibi doesn't hold up, so neither does yours. I don't know about the conductor. 
Being Suzanne's fiancé, you had a substantial motive to punish Ratchet. You used your detective skills, just as Detective Locke did, to hunt him down and finally avenge the death of your beloved. I... That's right, Mr. Poirot. I do have some detective skills. I never doubted it. Now, Fraulein Schmidt, the lady's maid with the soul of a cook. Fraulein Schmidt, you told me of your remorse for drugging Detective Locke. I believe you are sincere. However, as the cook of the Armstrong family, you experienced the drama from within. The death of Daisy, then Sonia Armstrong who died in childbirth, and finally Suzanne and John Armstrong. So much misfortune in that poor family. The death of this criminal is only justice. Let us move on to Countess Andreni. I was impressed by the earnestness of her husband when he swore to me solemnly on his honor that his wife never left her compartment that night. Should I believe it? Countess Andreni. Being Sonia Armstrong's sister, you had every reason in the world to want to avenge her. But you were incapable of stabbing someone, even after what he had done to you and your family. The night of the crime, you simply took a sleeping pill. I appreciate the irony that nearby, Detective Locke was also in a drugged sleep. When you awoke, you thought the nightmare was over. Rudolf? Hush, my love. Hush. Excellent transition. I was coming to you, Count Andreni. Twelve people. A jury. This was very important to all of you. If Countess Andreni did not stab Ratchet. Someone had to take her place. And you, Count, the beloved husband. I've seen how fiercely you love and protect your wife. Enough! I would do anything for Helena. Anything. Even that. Yes, even that. Let's move on to Monsieur Foscarelli. Detective Locke found out that you were the Armstrong chauffeur and that you planned to travel on the same train at the same time as Ratchet. That is what made her decide to obtain a ticket as well. Unfortunately, she could not prevent the murder. Ah, eh. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, have you lost your tongue, Mr. Foscarelli? Oh, Daisy. She was the delight of the house. Tonio, she called me, and she, she, she would sit in the car and pretend to drive me. And you, Mademoiselle Olson, a champion for the immigrants, a worthy calling. Mademoiselle Olson, you supported Madame Hubbard's story about her connecting door latch, a story that I later demonstrated to be impossible. So, you deliberately lied to me, and you also lied about Mademoiselle Debenham's whereabouts. Enough! I can't take this anymore! I know what you want from me, Mr. Poirot. Very well. Here it is. She was my little daisy, my angel, so patient. When I patched a scrape or took her temperature, that was my job. But she was so much more to me. She was a shining light in an ever-darkening world. I've tried to honor her by caring for children who have lost everything. Thank you, Mademoiselle Olson. 
You too shed light on your part in this mystery. You were Daisy Armstrong's nurse. I will ask you no more questions. It is enough that you have admitted what I know to be the truth and I understand. Let's move on. Dr. Constantine. You suspect me? I know none of these people. I didn't know Ratchet either. And I've taken a solemn oath to help people, not murder them. You are one of the few people in this room not to have any connection with the Armstrong case. Moreover, your alibi is confirmed by Monsieur Book, whom I would trust with my life. That is... that is very kindly said, my friend. We now come to Mademoiselle Debenham and Captain Arbuthnot, whose relationship was not in doubt from the moment I inspected your room at the hotel. You have a bloody nerve. Indeed, I do. We're getting married. Congratulations. But I would rather talk about your relationship to John Armstrong. That's the right answer. Captain Arbuthnot, you served in the army with John Armstrong. What I don't understand is why a man your age is still a captain. One might expect you to be a colonel as well. Ever fought in a war, Poirot? It was war that first brought me to England. Then you know what it's like. There's a shattering sound and death and mistakes acting on intelligence that proved to be wrong. I, I sent a patrol to their death. Good men, brave men, wasted. John testified on my behalf at a court martial. I'm not a colonel. I don't deserve to be, you bloody fool. But I'm also not in prison. John remained my best friend until, until, there, you have my story. Understand now? Archie, calm down, please. You're right, Mary. What you see in me, I don't understand. Oh, Archie, I see in you what John saw. Miss Debenham, I'm sorry. My turn, is it? I'm afraid so. And you have caused me quite a puzzlement. Your connection with the Armstrong family was not obvious. Then I remembered the job you currently hold. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. You were the teacher of... You were the teacher of Helena Andreni whose maiden name was Elena Goldenberg before she married Count Andrény. Yes, absolutely. Why lie to you? She was an excellent student. Captain Albertnot. You had one of the strongest alibis, thanks to Mr. McQueen. But his testimony melted like a snowflake. There went your alibi. Poof! Unless you have another one. As for you, Mademoiselle Demenham. Mademoiselle Olsen was the only one who could confirm your alibi. I think you know where you stand. Very good, Mr. Poirot. Are you satisfied? I will be, soon. Now I must turn to Sonia Armstrong's godmother, Princess Dragomirov.
Princess Dragomirov, you weren't on my list of suspects at the start, given your social position. I left my social position in a cold country. Do you object to being addressed as princess? I deny people the opportunity. It makes a good story to tell their friends. It also guarantees a good table in the best restaurants. Princess, there is also, forgive me, your extreme physical fragility. It does not stop me when I must be strong. Indeed. Of more importance, though, is the fact that you're the only left-handed person on the train, and the single blow to ratchet from a left-handed person was very, forgive me, weak. Finally, I'm afraid I know the alibi that you shared with Fraulein Schmidt is false. You have been very thorough, sir. I hope you will permit me to say we are much alike. I am honored. Now it is time to end with Mrs. Hubbard, or should I say, Linda Arden. If Princess Dragomirov hadn't told me about her relationship with this famous actress, I might not have made the connection. But you are a great actress, madame. Your performance as a flighty, self-involved woman was superb. I never would have guessed something entirely different. As for what ties you to the Armstrong family, it is obvious. That was easy. Mrs. Hubbard, you are the mother of Sonia Armstrong and Mrs. Andrini. Madame Hubbard, you really are a remarkable actress. You put so much effort into your character and into staging the murder. I saw it as a perfect mosaic, each person playing his or her allotted part. So carefully arranged that if suspicion should fall on any one person, the evidence of one or more of the others would clear the accused person and confuse the issue. Everything was meticulously planned. But you hadn't expected that Detective Locke and I would be on this train, and the avalanche would block it on the night of the murder. You had to improvise. But again, improvisation would be another of your skills as an actress. So, you came up with the story that the latch on the door that communicated with Ratchet's compartment was hidden by the handbag. I always fancied myself in comedy parts. That slip about the sponge bag was silly. Shows you should always rehearse properly. You know all about it, Mr. Poirot. You're a very wonderful man, but... Even you can't quite imagine what it was like. That awful day, I was just crazy with grief. So were the servants. We decided then and there that the sentence of death that Ratchet had escaped had got to be carried out. There were twelve of us, or rather eleven. Suzanne's father was over in France, of course. First we thought we'd draw lots as to who should do it, but in the end we decided on this way. It was the driver. Antonio who suggested it. Mary worked out all the details later with Hector McQueen. It took a long time to perfect our plan. We first had to track Ratchet down. Hardman managed that in the end. Then we had to try and get Edward and Hector into his employment. Well, we managed that. Then we had a consultation with Suzanne's father. Captain Arbuthnot was very keen on having 12 of us. He seemed to think it made it more orderly. He didn't like the stabbing idea much. But he agreed that it did solve most of our difficulties. Well, Suzanne's father was willing. Suzanne had been his only child. We knew from Hector that Ratchet would be coming back from the East sooner or later by the Orient Express. With Pierre Michel actually working on that train, the chance was too good to be missed. My daughter's husband had to know, of course, and he insisted on coming on the train with her. Hector wrangled it so that Ratchet selected the right day for traveling when Michelle would be on duty. And then, at the last minute, you came. For the rest of the story, you worked out everything, Mr. Poirot. 
You were right about all of us. What are you going to do about it? If it must all come out, can't you lay the blame upon me and me only? I would have stabbed that man 12 times willingly. It wasn't only that he was responsible for my daughter's death and her child's and that of the other child who might have been alive and happy now. It was more than that. There had been other children kidnapped before Daisy and there might be others in the future. Society had condemned him. We were only carrying out the sentence, but it's unnecessary to bring all these others into it, all these good, faithful souls. You are a director of the company, Monsieur Book. What do you say? In my opinion, Poirot, the first theory you put forward was the correct one. Decidedly so. I suggest that that is the solution we offer to the police. You agree, Doctor? Certainly, I agree. As regards the medical evidence, I think uh, that I made one or two fantastic suggestions. Then, having placed my solution before you, I have the honor to retire from the case. I'm sorry to wake you up in the middle of the night, Poirot, but it couldn't wait. There was a detail that bothered me in my preliminary autopsy of Ratchet's body. I went back to examine the body and I discovered a wound covered by another. The blow I hadn't seen was delivered by a thinner, sharper blade. So there were not twelve, but thirteen stab wounds. Twelve stabs for twelve jurors. It doesn't work with thirteen wounds. The symmetry is destroyed. It can't be one of the culprits who stabbed him twice? Doctor, a different knife was used. There is only one explanation. Somehow, some way, there is a thirteenth murderer on this train. We must tell Book. The case is not solved. Please, come in. Ah, book. I see we are moving at last. Yes. The way was finally cleared while we slept. If all goes well, we will arrive in Venice this evening. The train will be there for several hours for refueling and reprovisioning. What do we do with the 13th murderer? Do you have a lead? I thought about it. There is one clue that was left aside in my investigation. The diary I found in Ratchet's safe mentioned an appointment in Venice. Someone with the initials A.W. He will never keep the appointment, but there should be enough time. I must try to keep that appointment for him.
I don't have time for small talk. How would it look to the police if I asked a suspected murderer for help? I don't have time for small talk. How would it look to the police if I asked a suspected murderer for help? I don't have time for small talk. I think we should let Ratchet rest in peace. How would it... I don't have time for small talk. Doctor, a moment. Have you made arrangements for Ratchet's body? Yes, it will be collected by the Italian authorities when we reach Venice. The autopsy will be performed there. However, there is something odd. Oh? Since the train is French, jurisdiction must be shared. When I told them you were already on the scene, they have both agreed to support your investigation until we reach Paris. Ratchet's compartment will be sealed until we arrive there. All of those who conspired to kill Ratchet are to be confined to the train until then as well. So, thanks to you, I am the rope in a tug of war between two countries. Oh, but I thought you would want to be in charge. And isn't it odd we continue on our journey with a trainload of people that police consider potential murderers? Calm yourself, Doctor. It is not the first time I find myself in the middle. And, to be honest, I welcome the chance to see this case through. It is fast becoming one of the most challenging of my career. Would you be able to accompany me to Venice to follow a lead? I'm honored you asked me, my friend. I would have loved to help you. But I have to manage the situation here. I must make sure no one gets off the train in Venice and that Ratchet's body is transferred. So, my dear book, how does our journey progress? We are well on our way to Venice. All of our passengers are locked in their rooms by order of the authorities. I watch them when they want to stretch their legs, like the captain there behind you. I see that you have the situation well in hand. Doctor, a question. Could you assist my investigation in Venice? I can't, I'm afraid. I'm to accompany Ratchet's body when the Italian police take possession of it. I've been asked, commanded really, to help with the autopsy because of my earlier examination. I'm not going to ask a murderer to help me catch himself. Mademoiselle Locke, you are clearly an excellent police officer. Could you accompany me to Venice for an investigation into Ratchet's activities? There is much we still need to know. I... well, yes. It would be an honor to work with you. And... I'm glad you trust me. What do you have in mind? There was a notation in Ratchet's appointment book. He had an appointment. With who? There were only the initials A.W. They were to meet at 10 o'clock at the Fontana dei Conigli. I want to know who Ratchet was meeting and why. But you've already discovered the 12 conspirators. Why is this meeting important? Unfortunately, the case is not complete. Dr. Constantine has discovered the presence of a 13th stab wound. One of them could have stabbed him twice. The wound was made with another finer blade. Why would one of them have used two knives? Did they want to confess they killed him more than the others? And if so, why bother to deny it when they have already confessed. No, it makes no sense. And I do not close a case until all questions have been answered. You, of all people, must understand this. You're right. I do understand. 
I'll help you. Thank you. Together, we will uncover the truth. We will arrive in a few hours. Take the opportunity to rest. I slept well last night. No more effects of the drug. Excellent. Then, be prepared when we reach Venice. We have another mystery to solve. This is the third embarking dock, and no gondoliers available at all. With Carnival, you can't find a gondolier to cross that damn canal. They're all booked. The worst thing is that the fountain is just across this canal. We're almost there. I see a gondolier just over there. Hi there. We'd like to cross the canal, please. There is a bridge about a kilometer down the canal. Please. According to the map, the Fontana de Canigli is just across the canal here. No. I, Gabriele, cannot help you. I'm sorry. We'll miss the 10 o'clock rendezvous if we try to get through this crowd and have to walk a kilometer in both directions. Why is he refusing to take us across? He looks upset. I should try to find out why. If it's a matter of price, I'm sure we can work it out. Money? Money won't help me now. His problem isn't money. What is it then? I am sure this little problem will pose no challenge to you. It's impossible to find a gondolier during carnival. Every carnival, my friends and I mask, and every carnival, we lose one another. Sham, a beautiful bouquet crushed by revelers. Bella Chiara, the beautiful Chiara. A beautiful name for a beautiful gondola. Nice. I'm a pretty good detective after all. I'm sorry you had a fight with Chiara. What? How did you know? I'm a detective. I'd like to help, if I can. If you have a spare engagement ring, detective, I'll take it. Ah, I see. You lost the engagement ring you were planning to give Chiara? Lost? It is worse than that. I threw it away in the canal. I bitterly regret this gesture. I now find myself without a girlfriend and without a ring.
If we find the ring, maybe the gondolier will take us across. You are right. There is not much time. I will help you. Ancora una volta sono dalla parte spagliata del canale per la festa. Sorry, I don't speak Italian. <laughs> it's calm and relaxing. Although, not as clean as it could be. I know someone who will be happy. Excuse me, I believe I have something that belongs to you. Mamma mia, grazie mille, signorina. With this, I can now win my Chiara's heart again. I know it. How to thank you? My friend and I need to get to the other side. We have a very important date at the Fontana di Canigli. Ah, yes. The rabbit fountain. Of course, I'll take you across. Then I will call Chiara. Hopefully, she will forgive me. I'm sure she will. Well done, Detective Locke. This district of Venice is very charming. You will love it. If it's not too much to ask, can you wait for us until we return? Yes, no worries. I can call Chiara from here. To find the fountain, walk along the quay on the left, then cross the bridge and you are there. You cannot miss it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, signorina. You have made me the happiest gondolier in Venice. Yes, I assure you, I found your ring! <laughs> It's 9.55. The right time in the right place. Now A.W. just needs to show up. You made me run, Detective Locke. Poirot does not run. I'll wait sitting down.
Nobody. The desk clerk must be asleep or off partying. If there's no one to help me, they won't mind if I help myself. That doesn't help much. Nothing, no, that's not it. Nothing to Aziz Wadi. That's the only name that corresponds to the initials AW. Spacente, non ti ho sentito. Posso aiutarla? Hello, I'm looking for the Fontana de Canigli. Do you know where it is? Oh, it's right in front of the hotel. It's easy to recognize because of a rabbits. Thank you. I had an appointment with someone, but I can't find him. I wondered if he might be staying in your hotel. I can't help you unless you give me the name. I have an appointment with Mr. Aziz Wadi. Do you know if he's here? Well, unfortunately, he left the hotel this morning. He seemed to be in a hurry, but he left a carta. You are? I'm Mrs. Ratchet. Mr. Wadi asked me to give the message to the Signore, but I suppose this is okay. So, mademoiselle, was our mysterious A.W. here? No, but I managed to get his name, Aziz Wadi, and a letter he wrote for Ratchet. It seems to be a kind of riddle rhyme. Let me see. Well, Ratchet and Mr. Wadi must love this book to refer to it so much. Yes, I think we have to search and find the tracks that this person left for Ratchet to find him. I think so. Lead the way, Mademoiselle Luck. yourself, Joanna. You earned it. We have an appointment, I believe? I don't think so. I've never met you. Ha, ha, ha. 
things, isn't it? Think. Hey, you. I can't lose them. Move over. Too many! Too many masks! The murderer could be standing there watching me and, and laughing. The murderer got away. I'm coming back. But it looked like he dropped something when he climbed the first wall. All right, I'll go and see. For my part, unfortunately, I could do nothing for the victim. He was already dead. I have already alerted the Italian authorities. I will see what I can find while I wait for them. A pair of women's glasses. Was Ratchet planning a new identity? There must be several tens of thousands of dollars in this bag. There must be several... The victim was stabbed. Apparently, the method of choice in this case. A bunch of keys. If, as seems likely, Mr. Wadi is a resident of Geneva, then one of these may belong to his home there. Various clothes in his suitcase. Mr. Wadi was obviously planning to leave this city. Mr. Wadi's Swiss passport. I'll see if I can find a match on the internet to confirm his identity. That's the right answer.
a false passport with ratchet picture clock, ratchet, how many others? Now he will become Enrico Caldo. It appears Ratchet changed his identity as often as his socks. This direction looks promising. I'm sorry I couldn't catch the suspect, Mr. Poirot. There is no need to apologize, mademoiselle. Your efforts were marvelous. I found some information about Mr. Wadi. Did you access the FBI database? Don't worry. My little gray cells were enough. However, the database may confirm the origin of these banknotes. No need. I included them when I continued my investigation. Excellent. No, no, Joanna. That doesn't. Come on, Joanna. No, no. I don't need Mr. Poirot. No, no. Come on, Joanna. No. Come on, Joanna. That's a. No. I did something wrong. I don't need Mr. Poirot to tell me I'm wrong. No, no, Joanna. That doesn't track. That's it. No rookie mistake there. The detective gets it right. Score. One for the good guys. Mr. Poirot! It's part of the ransom money from the Armstrong case. You are surprised? I suppose not. So Ratchet had it in an account at the Banque du Lac. It would seem so. He knew the serial numbers on the banknotes could be traced, and he could not spend it. So he stashed it there. But now he's run low, something he didn't count on. He hopes enough time has passed so he can begin to spend the ransom money. Ah, there is something else he didn't count on. What's that? He didn't count on you. Detective Luck, and your tenacity. Thank you. But we are still left with a murderer on the loose. But we progress. We know Mr. Wadi had an appointment with Ratchet. He had a bag full of money and a passport with Ratchet's photo, but a new name. What is your opinion about the passport? I discovered that he was arrested in Armenia for trafficking and stolen art, and was supposed to be arraigned in January. Once again, he changed his identity and vanished. You are correct, mademoiselle. He also told me that he was threatened, and that threatening letter we found in his room was real. He had to disappear once again. The bag isn't very big. He could have easily run away with it. If he didn't take it, it was deliberate. He wasn't interested in the money. If the motive wasn't money, it leaves passion or revenge for motive. So, Detective Locke, what do you think? Passion or revenge? 
Revenge seems like an obvious motive to me. The murderer carefully followed Wadi from the fountain to the new meeting place despite Wadi's precautions. That is cold and careful. Excellent. We cannot yet know for certain, but that is a sound psychological analysis. We have an idea of the motive. It is the same motive as that of our 12 would-be murderers on the train. But we still must know who was under that mask. I think Wadi's killer is also Ratchet's murderer. The motive for both deaths was revenge, and both are related to the Armstrong case through the ransom money. Exactly. So our murderer is linked to the Armstrong case. The money is linked to the Armstrong case. But these glasses that I found in the bag, they must have something to do with this case too. Wait, those glasses mean something to me. Wait, I know. I've seen these. They belong to Susan Moreau, little Daisy's nurse. I remember seeing them in her bedroom, but they were gone the day she died. I remember the press saying that the nurse had committed suicide. I've always believed otherwise, and the glasses are proof that she was killed by Ratchet or his accomplice. He took those glasses. I always had a gut feeling, but now, Mr. Poirot, now I have proof Suzanne was innocent. Yes, you do. But the question I ask myself is this. Why did Ratchet keep these glasses? Ratchet used to leave fake evidence at the scene of his crimes to incriminate others. He did the same thing to frame Suzanne. Possibly. But keeping an object belonging to his victim as a souvenir of the murder, that is the behavior of a fetishist. Now that you mention it, in my investigation at the time, I had already found Daisy's hair clip in Ratchet's cabin, and now we find Suzanne's glasses in a bag for Ratchet. Two objects from two victims of Ratchet. He is a trophy hunter. Okay, we managed to clear up some of the gray areas. What now? The bag only contained a fraction of the one million dollar ransom of the Armstrong case. The rest must still be in a secure place. I will make a wager with you that it is the Banque du Lac in Geneva where Mr. Wadi worked. Wadi was also the keeper of Ratchet's secrets. They were killed by the same murderer. Agreed. Well, there is nothing more we can do here except wait for the police. Prepare yourself for a long evening with the police. We have a lot of explaining to do. And after that? A visit to Geneva, perhaps? Here you are at last. I was worried about you. We just left the police station. We had to explain to the Italian police that we were not murderers. What? Another murder? I'll tell you when we're underway. Are all passengers and staff aboard? Yes, everyone is here. We were waiting for you. Excellent. Let's not waste any more time. We have to make a longer than usual stop in Lausanne. What? How long? Long enough to do a little banking in Geneva. This is madness! A 13th murderer of Ratchet? Mon ami, he was not well liked. But Monsieur Michel would have seen anyone enter Ratchet's compartment. And there were another 10 people milling about, taking their turn at stabbing him. How could they not notice an uninvited killer?
the 13th killer could have acted when Michel was smoking on the platform at Vinkovsky. But even after the train departed, Michel was absent from his post at the end of the corridor several times the night of the murder. I must know where he really was and when. Oh, stay focused. We have evidence that he is still on the train. Yes, he most certainly returned to the train. How can you be sure? It's obvious. I mean, I hope Mr. Poirot agrees. Please continue, Detective Locke. All the passengers and crew are still aboard. If the killer of Mr. Wadi had remained in Venice, we would have noticed right away that someone was missing, and we could have alerted the authorities. I promise you. I made certain everyone was aboard before we embarked. Book, calm yourself. Calm myself? But we're back where we started. There is still another murderer on my train. Wait a moment. Can I change my mind about my verdict? Can we turn everyone over to the police? Everyone? <laughs> Including ourselves? What? No. I... No. No, no. Oh, oh, it's a nightmare. Let us take it step by step, my friend. We can start by eliminating all of the members of the Ratchet jury. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. That was easy. If we eliminate the 12 jurors, we are left with seven additional suspects. Seven? It's still too many. I agree. We must reduce our list. Excuse my impatience, Poirot. It's as if my beautiful train is cursed. Can you exonerate any of the seven? Adequate. Book worked hard to get me aboard the train. He is definitely not a suspect. Good. Mademoiselle Locke cannot be a suspect. She pursued Mr. Wadi's murderer. Fantastic. Dr. Constantine alerted me to the 13th stab wound. He is not a suspect. That was easy. I have four suspects left who I must now examine more closely. Miss Nielsen, Monsieur Maury, Monsieur Fauché, and Countess Andreni. One of my employees? Suspicious? All three got off the train in Venice to restock supplies. Any one of them might have slipped away without being noticed. I suppose. I suppose. But what of Countess Andreni? You cleared her yourself. She is cleared of the first murder. But we know little of her movements here in Venice. So we still have four suspects to interview. Detective Locke? I can't join you, Poirot. My chief saw something on the news about the case and my involvement. He's demanding an explanation. If I want to keep my badge, I have to call him. Then you must do so by all means. I'm sorry. No need to apologize. I understand. I'll make the call for my compartment. If you're looking for me, I'll be there. I hate to say this, Poirot. But I must. There is, of course, one other suspect with a motive for murder. The ransom money. You mean Detective Locke? Then who did she chase? Who killed Aziz? We both saw the masked murderer standing over the body. Doctor, 
I need to question Countess Andreni. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Mr. Poirot. The Countess had an anxiety attack when we arrived in Venice. She was terrified the police would come for her and her husband, despite how you concluded your investigation. I had to give her a sedative. She has been sleeping since. You have stayed with her all the time we were in Venice? Count Andreni begged me to watch over her. I have not left this room. You're the reason she's in this state! Book voted to absolve you all. I accepted his verdict. I told her. I tried to reason with her. What she has already suffered, the strain of these last few days, it was too much. I understand, Count. It's quite all right. I have the answers I came for. Ah, Michel, I have a few more questions to ask you, if you will allow me. Anything, Monsieur Poirot. We are in your debt. Please tell me your movements when we were stopped at Venice Station. Once the compartments were cleaned and the linen refreshed, I stayed in my quarters. Did you notice anything special? Comings and goings? Monsieur Book had asked everyone to stay in their compartments. I would occasionally walk the train to ensure everyone was comfortable. Oh, I saw Monsieur Maury was all alone loading his crates of provisions. A great chef like that, reduced to petty labor. I would have helped him. But Monsieur Book had ordered me not to leave the train for any reason. So, Monsieur Maury was forced to labor alone. Let us review the actual timeline of the night of Ratchet's murder, not the one manufactured to hide your crime. I left the train in Minkowski for a smoke, then I resumed my post. That was the truth. The train departed on schedule, but then of course an avalanche of snow blocked the tracks. At 12.45, Madame Hubbard and I met in her compartment to discuss how to adapt our plan. Due to the snow and Poirot. The little play we had staged for you had to be rewritten. I left your compartment at approximately 1.15. Then the curtain went up. Calls in the night, the red kimono. All for my benefit. And all for nothing, as it turned out. Do not blame yourself, Michel. I am the theater critic no playwright wants to see in the audience. You play well. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you. Many years of piano lessons thanks to my mother. I try to play in a few clubs in Paris when I get the chance. But as you can see, it hasn't made me rich. What can I do for you? Conversation only. Tell me about your time in Venice. I had Monsieur Book's permission to see my sister. She lives in Marghera, just outside of Venice. She had a baby a few weeks ago. This was my first chance to meet my new nephew. Monsieur Book gave you permission? Yes, you can ask him. Most assuredly, I will. What time did you leave, and when did you return? I left around 9.10 p.m. I was back by 10.45 p.m. When I got back, Hotaru was in a lot of pain. I gave him a back massage. That would have been enough time to kill Monsieur Wadi and return to the train. May I see your knives? Of course. They are here. If you don't mind. Help yourself. They are under the bar counter. Tell me again about your poker game the night of the murder. It's a regular game to help relax after a long day. Let's see, we started around 11 p.m. We took a short break in Vinkovsky, Hotaru, Pierre and I. The game finished up around 2 a.m. We'd all had quite a bit to drink. Ah, yes. I left for about 10 minutes to refrigerate champagne for the next day. That must have been around 1 a.m. None of these come close to the wounds on either body.
Good evening, Monsieur Mori. May I have a moment of your time? I have a few questions to ask you. Of course! As long as you don't mind if dinner is ruined. I promise to be as brief as possible. What did you do while we were stopped in Venice? With Freya's help, I loaded fresh produce for the next part of our journey. Then, you may not believe this, but my job requires a lot of physical labor. My back suffers. Fortunately, Jean has become quite adept at separating my vertebrae. As you may know, I have solved the murder of Monsieur Hatchet. That is a shame. I beg your pardon? The bastard sent my steak turtle back, telling John I was to burn it. I will add it to the list of his crimes. One wound on Monsieur Ratchet's body was struck by a very sharp, thin-bladed knife. We haven't found it yet. You think one of mine was used? I'd like to have a look, if you don't mind. In that drawer. Hmm, an impressive set of knives. But their blades are too wide to have been used for the crime. Tell me about your poker game the night of the murder. We started around 11 p.m. when John finished his shift. We played until around 2 a.m. From what I remember, it's a bit vague. You played without a break. Actually, we did break once for a smoke. Joan, Pierre, and I. When we stopped in Vinkovsky. When was that? Around midnight. is secured by some sort of locking mechanism. The design is formed by three commas. What is the word in Japanese? Tamoe! And it's obviously missing a piece. Good evening, Mademoiselle Nielsen. May I talk to you for a moment? Of course, Mr. Poirot. I'm not going to bed right away. Can you tell me your movements while we were stopped in Venice? Uh, that'll be easy. I didn't move much at all. Let's see. I helped Hataru load all of the food crates aboard the train. Hataru had everything he needed, but I realized they forgot half of my order. I spent over an hour on the phone with the supplier without success. I had to change the dessert menu for tomorrow. Dr. Constantine found a stab wound on Ratchet's body that was caused by a much thinner and sharper blade than the others. Possibly a chef's knife? My thought, precisely. And you'd like to see my knives? If you wouldn't mind. I would gladly show you if I had any, but I don't. I use the regular kitchen knives. You may search if you don't believe me. I see. All the knives the staff use are in the kitchen or in the lounge. Except... Except? Otaro prefers to use his own. Monsieur Mori doesn't use the kitchen knives? Not usually. I know he keeps a set of traditional Japanese knives in a box in his room. He doesn't let anyone else use them. Although now that I think of it, he has been using the kitchen knives lately. Can you tell me exactly about your poker game, the night of the murder? We started around 11 p.m. In Vinkovsky, we took a short break. Hataru and Pierre went outside to smoke. Oh, and Hataru got sick around... a few minutes past 1 a.m. 1, 10 a.m., maybe? He spent about 15 minutes in the bathroom, but he didn't want to quit on a losing streak. Did his luck improve? No, so we played to around 2 a.m. He lost every hand.
You told Fauché he could go into Venice? Marghera, actually. Not so far away. It was his only chance to see his sister. He's been working every train for weeks. There is never time to see the new baby. Enough, Book. Your heart does you credit, but your common sense, it... I know. But it's fine. Isn't it? He did come back. Oh, it's fine, as you say. Unless he saw the baby, then killed someone else and returned to the train. But that's monstrous. Murder is always monstrous, my friend. I've talked to everyone, but some elements of the testimonies do not seem to correspond. I need to recheck a few things. Any of the three staff members had the opportunity to kill Ratchet when Monsieur Michel wasn't watching the hallway. That's the right answer. Remind me of what you did when the train stopped in Venice. No problem. I helped Hataru load all of the food crates aboard the train. Hataru had everything he needed, but I realized they forgot half of my order. I spent over an hour on the phone with the supplier, without success. I had to change the dessert menu for tomorrow. Mademoiselle, I believe you're hiding the truth from me. What makes you say that? Michel saw Monsieur Mori carrying the crates of food alone. You weren't on the platform. I did help Hataru. The entire time? He carried so many crates, his back was sore. Ah, I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm guilty. I did leave him before we were finished. But I had to. There was no saffron he needed for a recipe. I volunteered to go into Venice and get him some. The Rialto market would be open late because of the carnival. He gave me money. I knew we weren't supposed to leave the train, but I only wanted to help. Mr. Mori can confirm this. Ask him. I saved dinner. Oh, on behalf of my palate, I thank you. How long were you gone? I left at 9.10 p.m. and was back with the saffron around 11. That's when I called my supplier for the items I was missing. Miss Nielsen had almost two hours to buy the saffron, find a costume, kill Monsieur Wadi, elude Detective Locke, and make it back to the train for that phone call. Yes, it's possible that was enough time. Thank you, Mademoiselle Nielsen. That is all for now. Sorry again, Mr. Poirot. I hope you enjoy tonight's dessert.
an object that looks like a broken comma. It must be part of something else. Colteria Venezia. Colteria Venezia. I'm sorry, Monsieur Mori, but haven't you forgotten something? You haven't told me about the knives hidden in your room. Ha! Yes, indeed. I forgot to tell you about those. They are my personal knives. I only use these knives. There are none better. I bought them all in Japan. No one is allowed to touch them except me. I'm afraid you are better at sushi than lying. What? What do you mean? One of the knives has an inscription, Coltelleria Venezia. Did you happen to go shopping tonight, monsieur? Damn you, Poirot. Very well. One of my sushi knives has been missing since the night of the murder. I thought you were going to believe I killed Ratchet. He routinely sent back my dishes to be ruined. Why does God give rich people the money to afford the best cuisine, but not the palate to appreciate it? I... I panic. I know a very good store in Venice. I went to buy a knife to replace the one that had gone missing. So. I wouldn't be accused. I assure you that I had nothing to do with any murders. I would have an easier time believing you, monsieur, if you put that knife down. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. What time did you leave on your little shopping trip? I left around 9.30 p.m. I was back a little after 11. 11.15 p.m.? Hmm. Time enough to stab Monsieur Wadi and return. Very well, Monsieur Mori. That's all for now. If I have another question... I'll be right here, cooking. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. Et voilà. What have you been doing, Poirot? 
I am completely in the dark. I will shine some light on the situation, my friend. I have three new suspects who could have killed Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi. Miss Nielsen, Monsieur Fauché, and Monsieur Mori. They all had periods of time during both murders to commit the deed. And their alibis are weak. A visit to family, and not one, but two shopping trips. But, but, all are my employees. Alas, yes, my dear book. But we have no proof against any of them. None of the three appears to have any motive whatsoever. But this is a tragedy. Do not give up hope. We will catch this murderer. There is still one place that may hold the evidence we need. Geneva. Exact. Do not give up hope. Well, that's easy for you to say. But what if it's Freya? What becomes of dessert? If it's Sotaru, who will cook? Me? And the worst, if it's Jean, who will serve the drinks? I've been checking up on the Banque du Lac. I had to confirm my identity for Interpol, so they contacted my captain at the Berkshire Police. I suspect he was not pleased. That my vacation was actually an unofficial investigation? I'll say. I would be happy to speak to him on your behalf. Thank you. But he'll get over it. It's a chance to close the books on the Armstrong kidnapping. He stopped yelling, asked for a report, then granted me an extra week. Excellent. What did you learn from Interpol about the Banque du Lac? It's had a bad reputation for over a century. Customers have included the Mafia, Nazis, corporate swindlers of every description, even heads of state. It is true, this. It is the worst kept secret in banking. They take advantage of the bank's strict policy of protecting the anonymity of its clients. This is in defiance of many laws from multiple countries, including Switzerland itself. Of course, I have never taken advantage of such a corrupt system. That goes without saying, my friend. There are ongoing investigations, subpoenas, court orders. The bank will eventually have to comply or its assets may be seized. But until then, it still thrives, thanks to its wealthy and powerful clients. It sounds perfect for the late Monsieur Ratchet. Do you have any ideas? The serial numbers from some of the bills match those from the Armstrong kidnapping. We agreed in Venice that the bulk of the money must still be physically in the bank's vault. I concur, Detective Locke. Exemplary work. So, our next task is clear. We need to get into Ratchet's safety deposit box. There will be codes, passwords. And Monsieur Wadi would, of course, have known them all. The bag of money he carried is proof of that. We'll need to find information about Ratchet's box in Wadi's office at the bank. Most assuredly, but remember the secrecy involved. I doubt his office will contain all we need. Where else must we dig? My little gray cells did not let me down. Mr. Wadi couldn't keep all of his secrets at the bank. Hopefully we'll find something in his apartment. We already have his address, thanks to his passport, and his keys we retrieved from his body. The train stops in Lausanne at 8 a.m. And that's far from Geneva. I can delay the departure until 11 a.m., no later. The police are expecting us in Paris by the end of the afternoon, at the latest. They won't tolerate any delay. The bank doesn't open until 9. I can see only one way that gives us a chance to be on time. Ferries travel between Lausanne and Geneva, but it would take over three hours. We can't depend on finding a faster boat. Better to take a taxi and pray traffic is light. The best thing is to separate. One of us searches his apartment, the other searches his office. To access the safety deposit box, we need to find the key, the box number, and the passcode. Suppose you find all this. How do you plan to get into the vault? We are going to use the bank's anonymity policy to our advantage. And the quickest way is for you to impersonate Ratchet. I would rather impersonate Jack the Ripper, but in the interest of justice, I will do it. We need to find the account number. Along with everything else. I will say I want access to the vault. They don't ask for papers or even names. The vault information is enough. I'm not hearing any of this. I run a trade company. I don't rob banks. Perfect. 
Let's recap the plan. That's the right answer. To sum up, we're going by taxi to Geneva. Then we'll split up. You're going to search Mr. Wadi's apartment. I'll search the office at the bank. When we have all the information we need, you pretend to be Ratchet, and we can finally find out what Ratchet is keeping hidden in his safety deposit box. It sounds impossible. Not for Detective Joanna Locke and Hercule Poirot. We should get some rest. You are right, Detective. We face our greatest challenge tomorrow together. Nine o'clock. Our driver did well. It took barely an hour to get here from Lausanne. But we must conclude our business in one hour as well. Book can only hold the train until 11 o'clock. One hour to find the key of Ratchet's safety deposit box, the box number, and its passcode. A lot to ask. Indeed. Which is why we must split our forces. I will take the cab to Monsieur Wadi's address. You must search his office. I have you on speed dial. And thank you. Mr. Poirot. For what, mademoiselle? For trusting me. You there. I have an appointment with Mr. Wadi. Let me check. I'm sorry, I don't see any appointments this morning at all. Mr. Wadi hasn't even arrived yet. Although he should be here by now. Even though your customers are anonymous, considering the amount of money involved, you should still have a mention of a meeting. Yes, I can't understand it. I'll be sure to ask Mr. Wadi when he arrives. In the meantime, you are more than welcome to wait in his office. I'll see you're not disturbed. Please follow me. can't understand where Mr. Wadi might be. You're right. I don't have much time at all. Time is not on my side. Uh, it's closed. I'm taking a picture of it. I'll send it to Poirot. It might be useful to him. A souvenir tower of Babel. Mm, makes sense. We know that Mr. Wadi is from Iraq, and the ancient tower is said to have been built there.
Alice in Wonderland again. Mr. Waddy seems to have really liked this book. I need the password. Maybe Poirot can help me. I managed to get into Wadi's office. I did a quick preliminary search. Everything is locked, including his computer. All I could find was a photo with a date on it. I just sent it to you. Maybe you can use it. Thank you. That might help. I've just arrived at the apartment. I'll call you when I find something. As quick as you can. I can't stay here long. I picked up in Monsieur Wadi's luggage in Venice will open his door. Great. Familiar projectile found in any pub in England.
That may be useful to Mademoiselle Locke or me. I'll take a photo. game to be sure, but I suspect checkmate is possible for white in three moves. Let's see. Staring at the clock won't help. Wow. Hmm, this computer won't give up its secrets easily. A Swiss and Arabic keyboard. A Swiss and... Staring at the clock won't help. Wow. Hmm, this could be the password to Monsieur Wadi's office computer. He must change it every month. It seems to have a logical sequence, but I need to find the one for December. If that's the password to the computer in Monsieur Wadi's office, we still need to translate the Arabic characters. And there weren't any Arabic characters on the office computer's keyboard. We need to find out which keys these Arabic characters correspond to on a Swiss keyboard with its Latin characters like the one in Monsieur Wadi's office. That was easy. This keyboard should help me translate this code. Arabic is read from right to left, so the password must surely be read that way too. With any luck, this will unlock the computer in Monsieur Wadi's office. Let me text it to Miss Locke. Et voilà! Ah, the pick habit some people have of displaying things on the door of their refrigerator. I've just sent a photo to you, in case it might help you. Thank you. Did you receive my text? This must be the password to Mr. Wadi's computer. I have it. Thank you.
Not bad. Hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. I wonder if it will fit the desk drawer. Those indentations are from the sheet of the notepad that was on top. This is great. All those mystery movies I watched as a kid. I know what to do. I'll send a picture of this to Poirot. I sent you a photo of doodles I found on a notepad. I hope it can help you. I hope so as well. What are you doing in there? I am Hercule Poirot. I am working with the police. You are Monsieur Wadi's neighbor? Uh, yes, next door. I heard a noise. I thought it was 
Mr. Wadi, who had come home. I don't know him very well. A delivery man left a package for him with me. You don't know your neighbor very well. Yes, what of it? How is it that Monsieur Wadi has a picture of you on his desk? There is quite a family resemblance. You wouldn't be his brother by any chance. Why are you going through his things? As I told you, I am working with the police. All right, yes. I'm his brother, Mehdi Wadi. Do you know where he is? I am very sorry, sir, but I have some terrible news for you. Your brother has been murdered. You have my sincere condolences. Oh no, Aziz, my wife, my son, their hearts will break. Everything he did was for his family. He brought us here from Iraq to give my son a better future. We can't go back. You won't, you won't. Do not fret, Monsieur Wadi. I do not want to cause trouble for you and your family. I am here to catch his murderer. When did you last see your brother? Two days ago. He was on his way to Venice. It was not a journey he was looking forward to. I knew something was wrong, but he promised all would be well soon. My son will be heartbroken. Aziz made the point of reading to Fadi every night so he could learn English. We hope to legally emigrate there one day. Your son, Fadi. What did Monsieur Wadi read to him? His favorite book is Alice in Wonderland. The nonsense of it all. <laughs> Why? It is the answer to a question I had. I believe your brother was a good man, forced for some reason to keep secrets, and that got him killed. Sir, there is something else. Aziz left me a letter to open if anything should happen to him. Could you show it to me? Yes, I, I will get it. Thank you for giving me this letter. Let me assure you, the man Ratchet cannot harm you. He was killed before your brother was. Really? Who did it? The one you say hunted Ratchet? Yes, without a doubt. I promise you, I will find them. Sir, we have no papers. The police... Your secret is safe with me, monsieur. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I must go to my wife and son. Tonight, I will read to Fadi from Alice in Wonderland, and we will remember my brother. I need to notify Mademoiselle Locke that I have Ratchet's bank account number. I texted Ratchet's account number to you. Wonderful. Ratchet's safety deposit box. At last, I should let Mr. Poirot know. I was able to access Mr. Wadi's computer. I have Ratchet's safety deposit box number. Excellent. Password is close. I can feel it.
I think this belongs here. I'm right again. That happens to me a lot. It looks like a safe key to me. We finally found it. Good news. I have found the key to Ratchet's safe. Perfect. We're running out of time. Do we have everything? I have the key to the safety deposit box. I have the number of the box. And we have the passcode. I'm on my way. Time to rob a bank. Sorry to keep you waiting. I haven't heard from Monsieur Wadi. You'll have to reschedule with him. This is quite annoying. I'll have to reschedule. Absolutely. I... I hope I have been of service. You have no idea. That was fast. We do this as planned? Yes, I am, Monsieur Ratchet. But with the bank's questionable policy, I do not expect anyone to ask. Right. Absolute secrecy regarding their clients. The last Swiss bank of its kind. Madame, I still haven't heard from Mr. Wadi. Well, we'll have to make do without him, now that my friend is here. It's his box we want to access. And the clock is ticking. I trust there is no problem. No, no problem at all. May I have your safety deposit box number? 4346. May I see your key? Do you know your passcode? Yes. Mademoiselle will be able to accompany me. No names, of course. Of course. I'll open the door. Go down the stairs. The guard will accompany you.
Please leave your personal belongings in this bin and then go through the portal. I'll open it for you. At last, we reach our goal. Now, I will insert my key, if you allow. Thank you. I'll be by the door should you need any assistance. At last. I suspect the effort will be worth it. This collection of various personal items. Do you know what they are, Detective Locke? I do, Mr. Poirot. God help me, I do. Souvenirs. The trophies serial killers take from their victims to remind them of their kills. Ratchet wasn't just a kidnapper. No, indeed. He was a monster. He knew the serial numbers on the banknotes which were traced. The rest of the Armstrong ransom money. The serial numbers match. Another bracelet. Another bit. Another trophy. And then there's the one that we already found. found. Suzanne's eyes glasses. Another trophy. We may never know how many people were killed. For every soul ratchet you claim, even more are suffering. I wonder who this keychain belongs to. Certainly not ratchet. MC. The real journalist Michael Clark. Ratchet would have needed to kill him to assume his identity. He took this ring as his trophy. Another trophy. A woman. We may never know her name. You were lucky, mademoiselle, when you met him at that cabin in the forest, alone. How many victims do you think Ratchet had? Too many. The one on the left. Ratchet. Whoever he is with, their friendship seems over. The build. The hair. It could be Noah. His partner in Daisy's kidnapping. It appears they had a falling out. Another victim. Diamonds. A fortune. Crime does pay. No, mademoiselle. This time it was the criminal who finally paid. Four years of investigation. It's all over. I finally have the last piece of evidence that Ratchet was Daisy's kidnapper and murderer. More than that, you have helped unmask a serial killer responsible for so many deaths. But even with all this, we're no closer to solving Ratchet's murder. On the contrary, mademoiselle, everything, it is coming together. Don't you agree, detective? What? The damaged photograph. It could be Noah. You think Noah killed Ratchet for revenge? The train. What about the train? I know how a killer could vanish without leaving a trace in the snow. Wings? Camouflage. The trophies. 
Poirot, we have a train to catch. Not just a train, Detective Locke. We have a murderer to catch. Poirot, enough! You have kept us in suspense ever since we left Lausanne. Forgive me, my friend. Detective Locke and I needed the time to put the last pieces of the puzzle in their proper places. I'll fill in where I can, but this is Mr. Poirot's show. I confess I can't help, but I feel a certain déjà vu. You are correct, Doctor. We have been here before. However, without you, we wouldn't have been able to reach the true conclusion of this story. My friends, your attention, please. I hope you have finished your dessert. You have every right to think the solution to the murder of Ratchet is a closed book. You are wrong. I, Poirot, admit that I was wrong. There is a final chapter. What in bloody hell? What does he mean? Perhaps if we are silent, Monsieur Poirot will explain. Most of us naturally expect a journey by train to proceed in an orderly fashion from station to station. But this journey has gone off the rails. A comfortable journey, which should have been restful turned out to be quite a challenge for my little gray cells. I beg your indulgence. I know it will be painful, but I must update you on the strange turn the Ratchet murder investigation has taken. I had two hypotheses, as you recall. A stranger boarded the train in Vinkovsky, killed Ratchet, and then exited the train unobserved. That was the first possibility. The second solution gave us 12 jurors who condemned Ratchet to death for the kidnapping and murder of Daisy Armstrong. My friend, Book, properly chose the first solution for the authorities. However, thanks to Dr. Constantine here, a 13th stab wound was discovered throwing that solution into disarray. Moreover, the words of a witness called into question the chronology of the night of the murder upon which the first two solutions were based. Detective Locke? admitted to having been absent several times during the night. His absence, therefore, gave multiple opportunities for a 13th murderer to slip into Ratchet's room before the other 12 jurors lined up to stab him. You are saying the man Ratchet was... was... when we... Yes. You executed a man who was already dead. But there were other suspects that night. Other suspects? Who? They stand before you. Mr. Fauché? Mr. Maury and Ms. Nielsen, and they all also had a hole in their stories about their movements that night. Mr. Poirot? Most of you don't know it, but there was a second murder in Venice. Mein Gott, another murder. The victim was a man named Aziz Wadi. 
a banker in Geneva who was on the payroll of Ratchet. He looked after the money Ratchet obtained from the Armstrong ransom. Ratchet needed money and arranged to meet Mr. Wadi in Venice. One of these three knew about that money. Now, each of them had an alibi of a sort, but if any of their alibis was a lie, that person had time to murder Monsieur Wadi, Monsieur Fauché, Mademoiselle Nielsen, and Monsieur Maury. One of you murdered Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi. Are you kidding? I pour drinks for our guests. I don't murder them. It's nonsense. You are accusing me because of my knives? But why would one of my employees kill Ratchet? The killer's motive for killing Ratchet was revenge, but not for Daisy's death. The motive for Aziz Wadi's murder was also revenge. Mr. Wadi was helping Ratchet. Ratchet had an accomplice in the kidnapping named Noah. They kidnapped Daisy together. Ratchet stored the ransom money in a Swiss bank that protected anonymous clients. He forced Monsieur Wadi to watch over the money. Once enough time had passed, Ratchet felt it was safe to have Monsieur Wadi bring him cash whenever Ratchet needed it. The serial numbers of the bills would still be in a file, but no one would be actively checking it. Precisely. But Ratchet didn't just keep the ransom in his safety deposit box. There was something much worse. There was something much worse than Daisy's ransom money in that safety deposit box. During her investigation, Detective Locke found evidence proving that Ratchet was what is known as a trophy killer. He kept souvenirs of his crimes. We found trophies in the safety deposit box. There were others in a cabin Ratchet used in the Berkshire Mountains, including a beloved toy of little daisies. If I'd have known that, I would have cut the bastard's head off. Not good. I must admit I'm not right this time. That's the right answer. The bracelet found in the safety deposit box was also on Noah's wrist in a photograph. It's obvious Ratchet killed Noah. And therefore, at last, I can tell you with absolute certainty who the murderer of Ratchet and Monsieur Wadi is. Mademoiselle Nielsen has the same bracelet as the one found in the safety deposit box in Geneva. A trophy from a victim of Ratchet, Noah. Having a similar bracelet doesn't prove anything. Yes, that might be true, if there were not an inscription on it. Mr. Poirot, you're right. The bracelet looks similar to mine, but I have no idea what the marks on it mean. I just like the design. The marks are not random, mademoiselle. These are special bracelets. They are called Morse code bracelets. Because, well, you know why. The marks are Morse code. Happily, I learned Morse when I was a young man doing my service for the Belgian army.
Et voilà. On the bracelet found in Ratchet's safety deposit box was the name Freya in Morse code. Your first name. It belonged to your father, Noah. Noah Nielsen. Let's stop playing this little game, mademoiselle. What does yours say? Noah? It says father. Ratchet. That bastard. He kept my father's bracelet as a... as a... trophy. Thank you. I have to admit your timing for Ratchet's murder was perfect. Do you mind if I continue? Would it matter? Go ahead. You've earned the right to crow. I do not make bird sounds, mademoiselle. I take no pleasure in this. You drugged Ratchet's dessert to ensure he would be unconscious when you went to his room. You stole a knife from Monsieur Mori. If it was identified as the murder weapon, he would be accused. You knew Pierre Michel would leave the train for a smoke whenever it was stopped at a station. At Vinkovsky, you waited until he was on the station platform. Then, you carefully made your way along the first-class corridor to Ratchet's room. You entered Ratchet's room with the pass key, accessible to all employees in the crew quarters. You stabbed Ratchet at midnight. But that knife, where is it? Probably thrown out of Ratchet's window before the train left the station. A thorough search after the snow melts should turn it up. My beautiful knife! Then, you carefully return to the crew quarters, replaced the passkey and return to your poker game. Et voilà. The affair was not so complicated in the end. But what made the crime seem more complex? Well... It was us. Exactly. The twelve jurors who proceeded to carry out their far more complicated plan literally in the dark without realizing that the man was already dead. Speaking only for myself, of course, but I believe we would have invited you to join us. Ms. Nielsen, you killed Ratchet because he killed your father. Your motive is crystal clear. But why did you kill Aziz Wadi? It's because of Aziz that my father died. My father knew Aziz was the only one with access to Ratchet's safe, so he convinced Aziz to steal the money from the safety deposit box. But Aziz was too afraid of Ratchet. Instead, he betrayed my father by reporting him to Ratchet. Obviously, Ratchet then murdered my father. Aziz was just as guilty of my father's death as Ratchet. Ratchet was the worst of humanity. But Monsieur Wadi, if you knew his story... My father is dead because of him. I will not debate the point with you, mademoiselle. He had done nothing to justify his death. I do not see any extenuating circumstances that should allow you to escape justice. You will be arrested at the Gare de Lyon when we arrive in Paris. Judge and jury are you, Monsieur Poirot. And you get away with it. It must be nice. But think of this. I know what you did. What you all did. She's right. She could turn us all in. Relax. Hector, is it? Your secret is safe with me. I'm not going to jail. Farewell, Poirot. Enjoy your victory. Stop. No, Freya, don't jump. You're going to die. I've made my choice. We'll let fate decide. No! She jumped off the train. Even if she hit the water, considering the height, I doubt she survived. 
And with this tunnel, either way, she's gone, Poirot. I still can't believe what happened. Thirteen people took revenge on the same person. This investigation is so incredible. It almost looks like a detective story. It would surely be a bestseller. It is true that this case will remain as one of the most important investigations of my career. My only regret will be that I couldn't bring Ratchet to justice, but I can finally close this chapter of my life. Your determination paid off. You can be proud of yourself. I think we'll be arriving in Paris soon. If you will pardon me, Detective Locke, I have to settle a few details with Monsieur Book before we arrive. Please, go ahead. I still can't believe Freya was the killer. She never even cheated when we played poker. She used too much sugar. Nonsense! Her desserts were divine! Unfortunately, her actions were not so divine. There you are, my friend. Ook, I have a favor to ask. Anything. When we arrive in Paris, will you speak to the police? I would rather keep a low profile. But why? Book, my first solution was incorrect. Nonsense! The nuttier the mystery became, the greater your brilliance. Please. Very well, if you insist. I want to thank you gentlemen for your service. The cuisine, under difficult conditions, you surpass the reputation of the Orient Express. That is true. I look forward to seeing you again abroad, Monsieur Poirot. I promise, not all of our trips are this eventful. Princess Dragomirov would like a word with you, Monsieur Poirot. It is important. She is waiting for you in her compartment. When a princess summons me, how can I refuse? Count Andreni, how is the Countess? Much better now that it's all over. I misjudged you, Poirot. And I you. There is something else about my wife you should know. Why I am so overprotective. She is pregnant. <sighs> you are quite the detective. <laughs> Actually, Dr. Constantine told me. She admitted as much when he was attending to her. If it's a girl, we are going to name her Daisy. If it's a boy, Hercule, he'll be stuck with Rudolf. It's a family tradition. I wish you and all of your family much happiness. Thank you. My daughter, my great friend, and I wanted to talk to you one last time. I speak on behalf of the entire Armstrong family, as well as those close to us. You have shown compassion. We know your reputation, and we understand that your choice was not easy for you. We are all the more grateful. Thank you. Congratulations, my dear. You managed to say the word thank you, although he did manage to put us through quite a lot. You have given us all closure and some peace of mind. You should know that I regret nothing. If this Freya Nielsen person had not been involved, I would have done it again. Someone told me the Stalinists were frightened of you. I believe them. The country of my birth 
breeds its share of brutes and bullies, but also some of the greatest intellectual and artistic minds the world has ever known. I pray that one day we will again be remembered for that. I share your hope, princess. And of course, with the real murderer of that man out there somewhere, we are no longer guilty of much. Correct? Princess, don't push your luck too far. If you'll excuse me, I have some packing to do. Ladies? At the end of this investigation, I still have my doubts. Did I make the right choice with the 12 self-proclaimed jurors? Yes, it was the right thing to do. As for Mademoiselle Nielsen, what would I have done if she had not escaped? A crime was committed. By letting all those responsible go free, I am no longer just a simple investigator, but a judge. This question will haunt me. Judges often take motive into consideration when deciding the sentence for a crime. You are not a judge. Your job is to establish the facts which you have done. The case has been solved. Another already awaits you. It is the reason you were on this train. It is time. Time to move on. Monsieur Poirot, I spoke with my associates. I convinced them to give you a deal on our new Firenze SUV. No need to thank me. It's the least I could do. That is very generous, but no, I do not drive. You don't? What? But it's electric. It's good for the planet. I am good for the planet, as long as I don't drive. Understand? He refused. Have you lost something? May I help you? Oh, Mr. Poirot, you have done so much already. What is it you have lost? My friends. We are traveling to Poland to help with children. We were to meet at an information booth. But where do I get information on how to find an information booth? There is, I believe, an information booth just inside the main terminal. Oh, thank you, sir. You are a great detective. And you, madame, are a good soul. Hey, Poirot. Say. Have you seen a scruffy little guy in a green trench coat? I cannot say I have. Why? It's my next case. Another case? That was indeed fast. The detective's gotta eat. You know what I mean. I have some idea, yes. Suspected embezzler. Traveling east, but not on the Orient Express. Say, 
You wouldn't be interested in teaming up, would you? Some good money in it. I have had enough of trains for a while, thank you. Okay, suit yourself. Mr. Poirot, Mr. McQueen here thinks he may know an attorney in the Berkshires who might need a gentleman's gentleman. He's old school English. I think the clock stopped for him in 1934. I hope it works out for you, Monsieur Masterman. What about you, Monsieur McQueen? Well, back to law school for me, following my father's footsteps. We can take the train to St. Pancreas, then the Piccadilly line to Heathrow and check out some flights. Might as well. We're already packed. I wish you both bonne chance. Ah, Poirot. Mission accomplished. I have reported to the police that Freya Nielsen killed Hatchet and that she escaped. They're issuing an international arrest warrant. There's a canal that runs alongside the tracks where she jumped from the train. But they say there's little chance she survived. The police have questioned all of the passengers and crew, so for now, they are free to leave. I gave them the results of my preliminary autopsy, and they have the report from the Venetian authorities. They were arguing about jurisdiction when I left. Thank you, Doctor. You have been of inestimable help. A fascinating case. I'm pleased I could assist you. Mr. Poirot, it seems our paths part here. It was an honor and a pleasure to work with you. And I am with you, Detective Locke. The case would have been impossible without your tenacity and dedication to finding the truth. You also proved to be an able con artist in Geneva. You too. <laughs> Thank you for everything. I'll never forget you. And I shall always treasure our collaboration. Hungry. Let's go to the Wagon Rouge restaurant. They make an excellent leg of lamb. But it's only 5.34 p.m. Is food all you really think about, my friend? I'm the one inviting you. You've well deserved it. And why are you? I'm not going to obtain for you a secret recipe this time. Poirot. They make a chocolate mousse that is so creamy. It must have a secret ingredient in it. The last recipe came from a murderer. But it was sublime. I didn't really have time to say goodbye when we parted. I thought I had beaten the greatest detective in the world. But you unmasked me. I still had my revenge, though. I even managed to help myself to a small amount of cash from Water's bag before you interrupted me in Venice. It will be enough to settle somewhere in a quiet little town where I will create delicacies for appreciative clients. You won't hear from me again, nor will Booth get any more of my recipes. Oh, and one last thing. You may not think so. But I truly believe Ratchet and Waddy got their just desserts. Regards, F. You, mademoiselle, are entirely too pleased with yourself. You give clues no one could follow, unless they are Hercule Poirot.